uh, Recording is in not progress. Well. Uh, so we are asked to first deal with the automotive uh, master plan. Uh, members then ask questions. And then when, when we're done, then we, we deal with uh, um, a poultry uh, master plan. Um, can we just check again if uh, the number or the members who are present? Yes, okay. Um, members present, we have um, yourself, Honorable Moimang, Honorable Dango, Honorable Namarihana, um, Honorable Boshoff, and Honorable Lont. Um, okay. I haven't received any further apologies and this member has them. Okay. The staff? Um, in, in terms of staff, we've got Ledumo and Enrico who are present in the meeting. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, from the Department's report. Let's start with the DJIC, uh, with the leader of the delegation. And if uh, the leader of delegation can also introduce um, the team. And then we go to the uh, Department of uh, Agriculture after the DJIC. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, it's Tandi Pele. I, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, I've already, as I've already indicated, I'm Ms. Tandi Pele. I'm the acting Deputy Director General of the Industrial Competitiveness and Growth Branch, the branch that is responsible for development and implementation of uh, with my team, uh, Ms. Damkululim, Master Plan and Progress to Date. Uh, and I'm here with Mumisa, um, um, the Chief Director for Agroprocessing, who's going to be taking us through the Poultry Master Plan, um, uh, Progress to Date. I'm also joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Um, Stephen Hannibal, uh, who's been brought in by the Minister. He's a, he's a DDG in the department but responsible for another portfolio, who's also assisting us in the implementation of uh, the poultry master plan. Um, also with uh, Ms. Sukiswa Akimani, who's responsible for industrial policy coordination. Uh, so he's the person that helps us with project management and so forth. Uh, and I see Dr. Mudisani uh, from Rural Development. He's here, Chair. Um, uh, he's Chair um, and We've got a couple of colleagues from the IDC and the NEF, but they are joining as observers to the meeting because a lot of the work we do in the different master plans have got uh, a lot of synergies in what they do from a financing perspective and support um, uh, perspective. So as a way of an intro, um, Chair, um, uh, today we're going to be taking you through the two uh, master plans that have been developed. It's part of a suite of the six master plans that as a department we have already approved to date. Uh, obviously the combination of uh, those master plan IFA, one, uh, the auto one is our biggest uh, export uh, revenue, uh, biggest contributor to manufacturing, and we have got an opportunity to really advance new technologies in that sector. It's got a lot of uh, 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 linkages to uh, other sectors, such as steel, such as plastics, uh, from a component a manufacturing perspective. So Mkuliru will take us broadly into what the master plan pillars are about, what have we achieved to date, um, and so forth. Uh, and Mumisa is going to take us through the poultry one. The poultry one, I think we have prioritized this on the basis of uh, the potential for rural development uh, and the ability to really integrate uh, emerging uh, growers and farmers into the supply chain. It's also important for food security, as you would know that poultry is one of our items in the basket of uh, basic food uh, for South Africa. So it's important that as we are driving industrial development uh, imperatives in those sectors, we are also cognizant of the impact and the price effects uh, to the population uh, so that we are able to keep uh, the price for food uh, consistently um, uh, to, for an, and affordable uh, for, for the, 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 the masses as, as such. The other four um, master plans, I'm sure at some point we'll have an opportunity to come and appraise the, 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 the committee, which is mainly sugar, retail clothing, leather, textiles, and footwear as one. 
uh, steel and metal fabrication. I'm sure the committee would have seen that we have launched that one um, uh, officially uh, about a week or so ago with the minister. And then the last one being on, um, on why am I forgetting the, the other one? Um, I, it will come to me, uh, Jay. Uh, so uh, mm. it's the six that we have done to date. Uh, we are in the process of also developing two. And I think as as the opportunities and the challenges arises in the different sectors, we do uh, adapt our methodology to ensure that we are really giving the right sectors the right support um, and we are able to really uh, piggyback on this master plan process that we have started with. Um, uh, that is aimed at really bringing social partners together to drive development and growth of the various sectors. There, my colleagues reminded me the last one is the furniture one. Uh, so with that bit of an introduction, obviously these master plans are being implemented and developed in the context of us wanting to implement the reimagined industrial strategy and also to anchor the economic recovery and the construction plan. Um, that uh, we give really, um, and we elevate the importance of manufacturing as part of our growth path. And we really leverage on the uh, linkages that are really brought uh, by the manufacturing sector as, as a whole, uh, from primary uh, activities up to services um, uh, sectors. So it's on that basis, uh, Chair, that we have uh, given a priority to a number of sectors. And uh, without further ado, I will allow Kululi to take us through uh, the auto one. Um, and as you had indicated, it's not feeling so good. So as soon as uh, he finishes and we, we allow the committee to um, ask us a number of questions, I request the chair that we release him um, so that he can uh, have a bit of rest for the afternoon. Thanks, chair. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Pelle. Uh, we, we had already received uh, a briefing on the sugar one uh, last year, uh, the master plan, but we'll continue uh, with all of them, uh, yeah, if uh, times allow, uh, yeah, during this uh, uh, term. Um, over to you, um, Kulun. We wish you a speedy recovery. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, uh, honorable members and colleagues. Uh, let's see, let's get the presentation. We can see the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we briefly gonna touch on uh, um, an overview of the South African automotive industry, uh, identifying where in the main uh, it's located, its performance in the past uh, year, and uh, some of the challenges that are facing this industry. Uh, secondly, we're gonna look at uh, what the master plan is all about, uh, its vision, objectives, and then the key focus areas identified in the development thereof. And uh, we're gonna look at uh, the major element of uh, our support to the automotive industry, which is the Automotive Production Development Program or APTP for short. And uh, we're gonna look at the, what we've achieved to date. As we know, we uh, adopted uh, the master plan uh, in 2018, November. And uh, there are also some other issues that are yet to be resolved and I will look at a uh, work in progress uh, and conclude uh, accordingly. Uh, looking at the structure of the auto industry, uh, in the main, the, the key component of the automotive industry is around the production of light motor vehicles. That would include passenger cars as well as uh, light delivery vans or what we call buggies. And in this area, we've got uh, seven major OEMs or uh, vehicle assemblers. OEM is for original equipment manufacturer who are located in the country. And in the main, they, uh, you'll find them in Gauteng, uh, in uh, Durban, uh, as well as the Eastern Cape. However, you would find the small component manufacturers in other areas such as the Western Cape, around Cape Town, or Atlantis area. Uh, there might be, uh, there are a few also in Northwest, uh, but in the main, uh, uh, 
the industry is spread amongst those three major uh, provinces. That's Gauteng, Eastern Cape, and uh, KwaZulu Natal around Durban. However, in the distribution of vehicles that we see on our roads, you have other independent importers who import and distribute vehicles that are not produced here. Uh, it, from Europe, you have Peugeot, Citroen, Volvo, amongst others. Well, whilst from Japan, you have the Hondas, Daihatsu, Subaru. From Korea, Hyundai, Kia, uh, Tata, and Mahindra from India, and also a number of Chinese brands, uh, your Great Wall Motors, Haval, and so on. Uh, we're hoping that as soon rather than later, uh, in the Eastern Cape, we'll have another OEM. Uh, Beijing Automotive uh, uh, Company uh, that has been uh, trying to build its plant uh, in the Kuha uh, area. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, these three clusters in Gauteng, KwaZulu Natal, uh, if we're looking at uh, the OEMs as indicated also in the previous slide, you find uh, three of the seven OEMs in Gauteng. Two, uh, one in KwaZulu Natal, which is Toyota, and uh, the rest in the Eastern Cape being VW and Isuzu in Kabeha and Mercedes Benz in Monte. Uh, in terms of the component firms that supply uh, to these uh, OEMs, uh, in the main, you find most of them around Gauteng. Uh, those in Gauteng and elsewhere don't necessarily only supply those uh, OEMs in Gauteng. They, you'd find that they also supply uh, other OEMs in other regions, but uh, they are themselves located in those regions. Most of them in Gauteng, uh, uh, followed by the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu Natal. Uh, in terms of the motor vehicle park, uh, on our roads, uh, registered vehicles in South Africa, we have about 12.4 million vehicles, uh, of which most of them are in Gauteng, about 38.5%. Uh, that is the uh, vehicles, uh, some of them are quite old, uh, but uh, the entire uh, vehicle park of uh, vehicle fleet, fleet in South Africa, most is in Gauteng, understandably so, with the population density and the economic activity around. Uh, KwaZulu Natal, 13.3%, and Eastern Cape, 6.6%. Now, if we look at light vehicle, vehicle production as a percentage of total production, uh, in 2018, we produced about 582 units uh, for the entire year, uh, calendar year. Uh, most of the production came from the Eastern Cape, 43.3%, uh, 33% uh, in Gauteng, and 23% uh, in KwaZulu Natal. Remember, in KwaZulu Natal, there's only one OEM. And in terms of exports, as a percentage of total exports, of which uh, we exported about 350,000. Most of the exports came from the Eastern Cape, followed by Gauteng and KwaZulu Natal. Now, let's look briefly on the performance of the auto industry in 2020. Yes, 2020 has been a, a difficult year with the onset of uh, COVID 19 and the, the attendant uh, lockdowns, not only in South Africa, but uh, uh, across uh, the, the world. Uh, however, uh, the industry uh, still contributed about 4.9% to GDP, uh, down from 6.4% to the previous year. Uh, the split there is on 2.8% in manufacturing and 2.1% on the retail side. Uh, the industry con uh, accounted for about 19% uh, of manufacturing output and almost 14% uh, of uh, total exports from the country. Uh, last year, we, uh, the industry employed about 106,000 people in vehicle and component production, down from about 110,000 uh, in 2019. Uh, yes, there's been a, a loss of jobs in the market, but uh, uh, the industry by and large has managed uh, to maintain its uh, production capacity. And uh, as you can see also in terms of investment, uh, last year, a total of 9.2 billion rand was invested by the vehicle assemblers uh, with the component producers adding a further 2.4 billion. In terms of a global production, South Africa is uh, uh, 
quite a, a small uh, producer or producing country at number 22 with a 0.58 percent of global production uh, last year we produced uh, under 500,000 units uh, but in Africa, South Africa is quite big, contributing in, a, in excess of 60% of vehicle production, which was a reduction from the previous year where we produced uh, 631,000 uh, units uh, during the year. Thank you. Now, whilst uh, we have uh, this auto industry in South Africa, uh, However, there are uh, uh, nagging challenges facing the industry here. Uh, one being that uh, South Africa remains a rather very small market, less than 0.6% of uh, the global market. And also to uh, complicate matters, uh, we are very far from uh, uh, other markets to which we export. Uh, we find that our exports in the main go to uh, Europe, uh, which is uh, quite a distance away. Uh, and that also uh, puts on uh, other competitiveness issues like uh, logistics costs, uh, and also in terms of the components that are used to build these vehicles. Uh, whilst we produce a sizable amount locally, but some of these components uh, have to be brought in from abroad. So that puts... Uh, uh, the local industry uh, in a in not a so good a position in terms of inbound and outbound logistics costs. Uh, whilst the regional market has major potential, however, it is uh, uh, undermined by uh, the absence of a common automotive regime. Uh, most of uh, the, if not all, the countries uh, in the continent. They do allow uh, the importation and distribution of used vehicles. Uh, even in SACU, uh, some of the countries, uh, Lesotho, Botswana, and them, allow the importation of used vehicles, be they from the East or Middle East. Uh, that uh, affects the total market. And uh, one other complication that we are seeing recently is also that uh, some of those vehicles whilst destined for uh, the neighbors end up being uh, driven on a local road, whilst we as South Africa do not uh, uh, allow uh, the general uh, importation and the distribution of used vehicles. Uh, also, secondly, uh, the local value addition or local content in the vehicles that are produced locally uh, is uh, rather low uh, at about 40%. Uh, which I think is something that uh, we need to actively address if we are to create a further employment uh, in the industry. Uh, also, uh, some of the markets that uh, we uh, export vehicles to are introducing stricter emissions standards. Uh, some of the countries have indicated that in the next uh, few years, they will uh, stop or totally ban the importation and uh, distribution of uh, uh, vehicles uh, driving on petrol engines or diesel engines in favor of the new energy vehicles, uh, mainly your electric vehicles, uh, because of uh, tighter emission standards. Now, we don't produce such vehicles as yet in the country, so that puts uh, uh, the business cases for uh, the local uh, assemblers uh, at a risk. And also we find that uh, coupled with the uh, stricter emission standards, there's growth of telemetry and movement towards uh, autonomous vehicles or high innovation or technology uh, uh, products, uh, which currently we don't uh, produce much of uh, in South Africa. And also it is notable that uh, uh, there's more that can be done in terms of empowerment in the automotive value chain in South Africa. Thank you. Now, the automotive master plan uh, was adopted and announced uh, in November 2018, following a period of uh, just over two years of intense uh, rigorous uh, engagements uh, by the stakeholders 
in the main NAMSA, NAKAM, NUMSA. NAMSA and NAKAM represent the vehicle assemblers and component suppliers. NUMSA is the major labor union in this industry. And of course, the government uh, in the main, uh, the, the Department of Trade, Industry uh, and Competition. We uh, agreed as the stakeholders on a vision 2035. Uh, by that vision, why 2035? Uh, we're looking at uh, approximately two model life cycles uh, in this industry. Generally, a vehicle production runs over a seven year period. Uh, in this industry and uh, after seven years, a new model uh, gets introduced. So we're looking at a globally competitive and transformed industry that actively contributes to the sustainable development of South Africa's productive economy, creating prosperity for industry stakeholders and broader society. That is the vision that uh, was agreed upon. And uh, that uh, vision will be uh, uh, the master plan itself has uh, six uh, objectives. One uh, is to increase uh, production uh, volumes in the country uh, to at least 1% of global production. And uh, according to projections, then uh, we're projecting about 1.4 million units to be produced in South Africa by 2035. Because with higher volumes of production, economies of scale, it becomes uh, easier to localize some components. Uh, uh, and therefore, and also the attendant uh, uh, employment creation across the boiling chain. So uh, we know, uh, however, nobody anticipated what would happen in 2020 uh, when we had these objectives. However, they are the objectives of the master plan. We have to uh, uh, try see them through. Uh, secondly, uh, for South Africa to have a, an embedded uh, sustainable industry, increasing the local content to about 60% uh, is required. It is a very tough call, uh, seeing that uh, most of the value in a vehicle uh, is uh, associated with the drivetrain, that is your engine and uh, um, the telemetry part of it uh, or the electronics going into a vehicle. And most of those uh, components are imported at the moment. Because of our volumes, uh, it's uh, becoming a rather a difficult proposition to localize the production of uh, such components. However, uh, we think uh, there are opportunities uh, to increase that uh, local content from the current 40% uh, by localizing a variety of components. Uh, thirdly, uh, if we can in, uh, increase that uh, production uh, to 1.4 million units and increase local content, we think it is possible that uh, we can double employment uh, in the industry to about 220,000 uh, persons uh, involved. Of course, in the vehicle assembly uh, line, uh, uh, there are fewer people with most people uh, employed in component manufacturing. Uh, currently, you have a split of about uh, 30,000 uh, in vehicle assembly and uh, 80 plus uh, thousand in uh, component uh, production. And we think that uh, with the increasing local content and the higher volumes of production, uh, we stand a chance to increase employment. It also becomes uh, important to continue uh, improving manufacturing competitiveness, uh, con competitiveness levels to that of leading competitors. Uh, we're competing with other jurisdictions like you know, Thailand and others who are quite competitive in many of the vehicles that they produce and uh, that we produce in South Africa. We continuously have to ensure that uh, uh, manufacturing competitiveness practices uh, are improved and uh, enhanced all the time. Uh, the number five, we need to transform the industry across the value chain. Uh, and in doing so, we would identify specific areas to commence with. Uh, there are various areas where we think uh, that uh, uh, transformation can take place. 
it is difficult in some instances where you're dealing with uh, multinationals who are not too keen or used to uh, uh, selling shares in their operations. But uh, we think that in terms of employment, in terms of skills, uh, having people in management positions and others, and bringing in new component suppliers into the industry, uh, so new ones that are locally uh, are locally based that are empowered uh, is an opportunity that uh, needs uh, to be explored. And also, lastly, we need to deepen value addition. That means we need to do more uh, locally. Uh, we uh, have some minerals that uh, uh, can be used in the, the production of vehicles uh, from your PGMs, uh, steel and others that we need to ensure that uh, they are benefited and used in such uh, uh, in the production of components and vehicles. And also we need to have uh, linkages, strong linkages, develop strong linkages with the regional market. Uh, where we can perhaps uh, uh, use uh, uh, copper from uh, uh, Zambia and so on in making the wiring harnesses and stuff. So those would be the key objectives of the master plan. Thank you. Now, with all the, with the vision and the objectives, uh, the master plan identified eight focus areas. Uh, in order to achieve uh, that vision and uh, those objectives, such that uh, all our activities going forward need to focus uh, at least on the first six, with the last two uh, being seen as a foundation for ensuring that uh, the master plan is implemented correctly uh, and that uh, the industry uh, not only survives but grows. One, on local market optimization. Uh, in, here in, we are looking at a, a variety of issues uh, like uh, limiting the importation of these so-called gray vehicles. Uh, I indicated earlier that some of the vehicles destined for our neighbors end up being driven on South African roads. Uh, now we need to strengthen uh, law enforcement, uh, registration of vehicles uh, in that sphere so that uh, those illegal imports uh, into the country uh, are stopped so that our market uh, is available for, for the industry is not uh, diluted uh, by such uh, gray imports. That is just uh, one of the activities uh, that we'll be looking at uh, under local market optimization. Uh, secondly, we need to develop uh, the regional market. Uh, currently, there are engagements on rules of origin related to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, with the aim of ensuring that uh, trade in autos uh, happens in a fair manner that also benefits South Africa. There are also ideas of uh, forging uh, bilateral and multilateral agreements or what uh, one might call also an automotive pact with uh, identified countries who are beginning also to produce vehicles uh, in their uh, jurisdictions. Wherein as South Africa will be supporting uh, those activities uh, and also over time as they develop, be able to source uh, some of the componentry from uh, those countries. Uh, countries such as Ghana appear to be first movers uh, as they have recently adopted a, a, a policy that uh, supports uh, the creation of uh, an automotive industry uh, therein. And uh, to that extent, uh, some of the local uh, vehicle assemblers are now exporting components uh, for final assembly in those areas. We think that uh, there, there is a possibility to include other countries as well, uh, such as Kenya, for example, um, and others. So we need to develop that regional market. On localization, uh, in the quest to increase local content to about 60%, we are 
uh, identifying a number of components that currently are being imported that uh, uh, we think uh, can be localized. In this instance, uh, it becomes uh, uh, important at times to uh, encourage the vehicle assemblers to jointly source uh, from a supplier that may localize uh, so that at least there's a, a sizable volume, enough volumes for that uh, supplier to uh, grow uh, in South Africa. Uh, there's a, a number of uh, uh, components that are, are being identified where uh, business cases are explored and uh, uh, with a view that uh, they will see further localization of such uh, uh, components. They would uh, range uh, from uh, carpets in a vehicle to sun visors to seats uh, and others. Uh, so continuously we're looking at uh, opportunities uh, to localize uh, some of uh, the components that are used uh, in the vehicle manufacture. Of importance also is to ensure that uh, our infrastructure in South Africa uh, is uh, efficient uh, and uh, it, it works well. Uh, because we import a lot of uh, components, we export as well. Uh, so we might, uh, we need uh, under this uh, infrastructure development to look at uh, uh, the most efficient way to take the vehicles that are produced, for example, in Gauteng, out uh, of the country, I mean, down to the coast, out of the country, in an efficient way, in a, in a way that uh, doesn't increase the cost unduly. Uh, there's been a, a number of challenges in this space. Uh, uh, it, this also talks to the creation of uh, automotive uh, manufacturing parks, uh, such as what we have in Roslyn, uh, and also uh, next to Ford, which was launched uh, uh, recently, where all the suppliers would be located there so that they can be able to supply just in time to the uh, production line of Ford, uh, and uh, they can share some of uh, the, the common uh, uh, issues and they would be uh, quite close to the plant itself. So uh, on infrastructure development, there are such uh, issues that we look at, We're looking at the port infrastructure, uh, rail infrastructure as an example. Five, uh, industry transformation. Uh, in here, a, a major project uh, which has started operating this year uh, in terms of accepting uh, uh, applications was the formation of uh, the Automotive Industry Transformation Fund, which seeks to uh, bring in a, a new empowered suppliers into the industry. So they will provide not only funding, uh, but uh, also the uh, vehicle assemblers commit uh, a market uh, for that production. So if uh, a company gets support uh, to buy the required machinery and so on under this program, they would also be linked to an OEM or OEMs to which they will supply that product because having the capacity but not the market uh, is not good at all. Um, so the provision of a market for such empowered companies over time uh, is an important part thereof. And also opening up uh, the market to new players, uh, to previously excluded people uh, is one of the issues being looked at under industry transformation. Then new technologies, uh, we're talking uh, um, new energy vehicles such as uh, hybrids and battery electric vehicles. Uh, we're talking uh, new technologies in communication such as telemetry uh, that uh, we need to prepare uh, for localization of such technologies and also uh, skills remain important. With the advanced uh, technologies in these new products, uh, the kind of skill requirements changes over time. And uh, not only in the production, but also in the servicing of such vehicles. 
Uh, gone are the days where uh, somebody would come with a big spanner and a hammer only, but uh, now they come with a, a computer, plug it in your car, identify where the fault is. So we need to also ensure that uh, the requisite skills are developed in the country. And then number seven, institutionalizing the master plan to ensure uh, improved monitoring and evaluation. Uh, to this extent, we have an executive oversight committee, which is chaired by the Minister of uh, DTIC, uh, wherein also in that committee, uh, uh, the leadership of the industry and the uh, labor uh, sits. <coughs> Currently, this meets uh, four times a year to look at uh, implementation issues, see what a uh, could be the blockages that need uh, intervention, uh, basically to ensure uh, that uh, the master plan is being implemented and that uh, we are on our way to achieving the objectives. So we've institutionalized uh, the master plan. Uh, the EOC came into operation uh, almost two years ago in 2019. And uh, we have uh, as part of that uh, six working groups each working group uh, has got a uh, focus area according to the six above uh, focus areas. We have a working group on local market optimization, regional market development, localization, and so on. So that is in place uh, currently. And lastly, uh, we needed a supported policy. As you would know that in the past, uh, since uh, uh, democracy, we've had uh, what we call the MIDP, or Motor Industry Development Program, that uh, came into operation in September 95. And then uh, we changed uh, it to APDP, uh, effective uh, 2012. Uh, we still have the APDP, but uh, in order to uh, focus it uh, to the new vision and the objectives, we needed to make amendments to the APTP as we had it, uh, so that now uh, we reward uh, a more local value addition uh, and so on. So the amendments to the APTP uh, uh, needed to be made as well uh, as part of implementing uh, the master plan. Next slide. What have we have been achieved to date? Well, as I indicated, the EOC and seven working groups are, are operational. The transformation fund is operational. Uh, currently, uh, the contributors to the transformation fund are the vehicle assemblers, but we are in the process of also including uh, component suppliers. So from the initial uh, value uh, indicated when uh, this was launched, now uh, the component suppliers would add on to that uh, fund as well. Uh, thirdly, uh, in support of the regional market, uh, we have included the exportation of a semi-knockdown kits uh, under the APTP as well. Semi-knockdown kits are basically where a vehicle is produced locally, uh, fully produced in one instance, and then uh, uh, disassembled uh, to the various major components, put in a container and exported uh, for final assembly in the uh, uh, destination. Or a vehicle is uh, produced, but uh, it's not fully produced in the country. The body is made, it's painted, uh, but some components are not uh, assembled into the body. Uh, it's all put in a container and exported for final assembly in the destination country. So in, initially this was not allowed under APTP, but uh, since February this year, this uh, is allowed uh, and that supports uh, the final assembly in the various countries uh, in the continent that I've spoken to. They are still at uh, the initial stages of a vehicle assembly or, or motor production, and therefore they would start with uh, those kinds of activities, SKD uh, operations. And on the, the APDP, the regulations that were published earlier in the year, and uh, the APDP 2 as amended 
uh, should be coming into force uh, next month. Um, uh, also, as part of the APTP, we have the Automotive Investment Scheme, uh, which is also coming into uh, operation uh, from next month. Uh, these have been amended in line with the master plan uh, vision and objectives. Thank you. And on the APTP uh, amendments, in the main, uh, it remains with the key four elements. Uh, the moderate import tariffs since 2012 haven't been changed. However, for vehicle assemblers, we changed uh, uh, the current volume assembly allowance to a volume assembly and localization allowance, where uh, the benefits would, uh, in the main, uh, be based uh, on uh, local value addition. So it means therefore by and large that uh, uh, the vehicle assemblers have to increase uh, their local content to get the same benefits they would get under the previous regime. Uh, in that way, we think it would encourage them to localize uh, and increase uh, local content. Thirdly, we also have what we call the production incentive which we increased slightly by 25 basis points uh, with a, a view to further encourage uh, localization. This is due to both uh, the vehicle assemblers and component suppliers, uh, so that uh, they, uh, we're supporting them slightly more uh, than the previous regime on uh, uh, making some components locally. So based on uh, the local value addition, they get slightly more. Uh, we think that uh, these two, number two and number three, would encourage, therefore, uh, uh, increased localization uh, and uh, that leading to increased local content in the country. Lastly, we still have the automotive investment scheme, uh, which is in the form of a, which is a cash grant which we've also kind of tweaked uh, to support more uh, local tooling and uh, uh, local value addition. So if you invest uh, in the productive capacity in the country, uh, depending on uh, the level of investment and other uh, criteria, you get a certain percentage after starting production back over a three year period uh, that uh, uh, is seen as a, a way of uh, facilitating uh, encouraging investments into the country. Thank you. Now, there are other issues. Uh, the master plan in itself, uh, we see it as a, a living uh, strategic document. It's not complete. Uh, there are a few issues uh, that uh, still need to, to, to be addressed. In the main, uh, the first two, uh, your new energy vehicle policy, you would note that uh, recently on May 18th, uh, the minister published uh, a green paper on new energy vehicles. Uh, the idea is to develop a policy that would uh, support localization of uh, electric vehicles in the country. It's a new technology, uh, uh, quite difficult to get into, uh, rather expensive, and the products uh, thereof uh, still expensive now, uh, but we think it is important for South Africa not to be left behind. Otherwise, uh, we might find uh, the local industry not having enough of a market, and we might find ourselves being net importers where we buy these electric vehicles and the related products uh, uh, from abroad. Secondly, uh, we uh, looked in developing the master plan, we had also started uh, investigating the possibility of setting up uh, the production of motorcycles uh, in the country. Currently, there's nobody uh, uh, on a serious commercial scale uh, producing motorcycles. Uh, we were almost uh, ready to include them in the APDP, however, uh, uh, we still need uh, further engagements uh, with uh, the players in this area. And you would note that now there's even uh, better opportunities uh, with uh, the lockdowns and uh, the growth of uh, uh, 
uh, product deliveries from stores, uh, from restaurants. Uh, there's a lot of uh, motorcycles now uh, in our communities where people uh, deliver uh, products to households. Uh, so it's uh, something that we also starting uh, to uh, uh, or continuing to work on uh, with a view to include uh, them uh, in the not so distant future. However, also uh, linked to, to local market optimization, there are two areas uh, <coughs> that uh, we we'll focus focusing on, uh, dealing with the used tire imports. We find uh, a lot of these uh, uh, passenger tires being imported and sold everywhere. Uh, and uh, these are not supposed to be imported into the country anyway, uh, passenger tires. Uh, we had allowed uh, uh, the importation of uh, truck tires uh, for trading, but not passenger tires, but we still find them here. And also the used vehicle imports, uh, mainly it would be vehicles that come through our ports destined for the neighboring uh, countries, but end up in South Africa. These are some of the issues uh, that uh, uh, still need uh, to be properly addressed. Thank you. Now, what has happened? Uh, what, what, what do we have in, 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 the, in the various committees currently? or work streams. Uh, on local market optimization, uh, some of the interventions that uh, we're looking at, we're looking at uh, the possibility of designating light motor vehicles for preferential procurement. Uh, we're also looking at dealing with used tires and used vehicle imports. On regional market development, uh, we're looking at uh, finalizing and developing the terms of engagement under uh, the free trade agreement. As I indicated, uh, there are discussions continuing and almost complete on rules of origin, amongst others. We're exploring uh, bilaterals, uh, the possibility of bilaterals with the likes of uh, Ghana, but it's still uh, at a stage where we uh, are studying uh, those markets. On localization, uh, as I indicated, there's continuous identification of components uh, and, and materials that can be localized. Components that can be localized and uh, also materials that can be beneficiated uh, uh, to a stage where the components are supplied into local vehicle assembly. On infrastructure development, we are currently um, finalizing uh, port efficiency and rail efficiency studies with a view to developing uh, appropriate interventions uh, to improve such. On industry transformation, uh, in the APDP now, as against the past, we have uh, a PE requirement uh, as a, a contained in the regulations and in the guidelines, we try to uh, expand on the specific uh, levels to be achieved to encourage transformation. And uh, on, under the AITF, there are at least 12 applicants that are being evaluated. Uh, in May last month, the minister indicated that there were four that were due to be supported. Uh, under AITF, two have been finally approved. Two, uh, there's uh, just a few things in principle, they are supported. There are two, uh, there are a few issues uh, outstanding, but. Uh, Shortly in the next few days or so, those will be finalized, whilst uh, there are uh, more than six uh, others that are being uh, evaluated uh, for support under the transformation fund. On technology development, in the main there, currently we're looking at uh, developing uh, an MEV roadmap flowing from uh, discussions that led to the green paper that was published uh, on the 18th of May. The idea is that uh, shortly we should have uh, a firm policy on how we're supporting uh, uh, electric vehicle, uh, not only distribution, but local manufacturing. On skills development, working with a variety of stakeholders like uh, higher education and training, there is a skills audit taking place now uh, with a view to developing appropriate interventions uh, for the industry uh, shortly. 
Thank you. So in conclusion, uh, the industry is showing signs of recovery from uh, COVID-19 lockdowns. As you see, as you can see earlier, uh, whilst in 2019, we produced more than 600,000 vehicles. Uh, in 2020, it was about 440 odd thousand units, uh, which is a serious drop from the previous year, but uh, uh, we're showing signs of uh, uh, improvement also on uh, vehicle sales. Uh, there are a number of localization efforts being pursued, also working with other master plans, for example, the steel master plan, where we're looking at uh, developing uh, appropriate steel uh, that uh, is used, uh, that can be used in automotive production. And the competitiveness enhancing initiatives uh, are continuing. We have uh, uh, an automotive supply chain competitiveness initiative that looks at firm level competitiveness improvement that would continue and uh, there are more in the pipeline. And lastly, we're looking at uh, developing a support framework for new energy vehicles uh, uh, shortly so that uh, we can start uh, not only uh, buying and se selling those uh, electric vehicles, but uh, producing uh, some of them locally and the components thereof. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the presentation. Um, <laughs> though it was a theme uh, in terms of uh, the content, uh, written content, uh, but uh, there's more information as you were elaborating. Uh, we would like the other way around uh, that we have more information written so that uh, even outside the meeting, we can follow up uh, on the report or the briefing, uh, we can read uh, on our own. And then, then at least you will be thinner in terms of elaborating because uh, more information would be contained uh, in the in the slides uh, that uh, you present. Uh, but anyway, then thanks uh, very much because uh, there was an indication that uh, you need to be released. Uh, so we will first deal with the questions that relate uh, to the automotive uh, uh, master plan. And then once we're done uh, with the automotive master plan, then we, we get a presentation uh, on the uh, poultry uh, sector master plan. Uh, Honorable members, can we then ask questions? Am I audible? Oh, yes. Yes, you are audible, Charles. <laughs> I usually hate that uh, thing when a person asks, am I audible? But now it was so quiet. <laughs> 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 OK, uh, I do have hands. Uh, let's start with you, uh, Honorable Maimank, uh, followed by uh, Honorable Dango. Uh, Honorable thank you, thank you. Yeah, in that order, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let me uh, uh, start by welcoming the presentation uh, from the team. Uh, <clears throat> indeed, it put us in a much more better position to understand uh, <clears throat> how the, the automotive industry has evolved, the challenges that, uh, that uh, it is going through and the and the uh, the uh, changes affected in terms of uh, both policy and legislation, uh, <clears throat> and uh, also the enabling team uh, through the working working streams uh, that were also identified. I just want to have two two areas that I I need clarity on, Chair. <clears throat> Uh, the first one relates to the point that was raised around around uh, the the I think the uh, the uh, the energy driven the energy driven vehicles 
uh, I there's 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 a, there's, a, there's an area that I, I thought maybe uh, the team will probably raise. Uh, what is the the involvement of the of the transport sector uh, in this area? Because I want to believe that the like as you indicated when you started, you did indicate that at the level of uh, of the poultry poultry master plan. Uh, the Department of Rural Development and, and Agriculture is, is on board. Uh, I, 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 I couldn't get that when, when it, it, it relates to, to the, uh, when it relates to the uh, automotive industry. And the reason this point, because in certain areas we'll find that uh, the, the misalignment of policies uh, which might be struggling across uh, various uh, government departments. Sometimes it is an inhibiting factor in terms of ensuring that uh, ensuring that there is a, a one common message that is uh, that that is uh, 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 preached. So I needed to to get a sense from 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 from, from the team in terms of. Uh, uh, is there an alignment? Because even the transport department is talking about the electricity driven cars. So is there an alignment between, between uh, the, what, what the Department of Transport is doing and also what is the, what the Department of Trade and Industry is doing? Uh, because uh, uh, the, the issue around alignment of policies is quite important. Uh, the the second one relates to relates to the issue of uh, uh, local auto, lo localization as it was raised. Uh, one of the areas that we have identified in in our, in our country is the issue is the impact of of uh, the uh, structural. Uh, 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 a limitation that inhibited the growth, the growth of our of our economy, and uh, I want to believe that uh, it has also uh, inhibited localization. And uh, in, in that way, I'm much more interested to get a sense uh, in terms of uh, uh, in order to, to 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 address this structural reform. There might be there might be a, a need to to for the for the for the uh, plan uh, to have a targeted approach in terms of uh, uh, it confronting the structural reforms on the automotive industry, and uh, it could relate to two areas. The, the first one she will be. Uh, stimulating local business for the automotive industry uh, to procure from and also support economic growth uh, with a view to ensure that we increase automotive demand. Uh, in addition to that, the, the, uh, this could also assist in addressing the low hanging fruit such as scrap metal and localization and rail and port efficiency. The, the, this uh, issue and also believe that it could also relate to the, uh, what are the opportunities that are there in terms of the special economic zones around, around this automotive uh, uh, industry program, uh, which I believe that uh, it could be used more efficiently. But I think the challenge is uh, do uh, we have small suppliers that has access to these advantageous, uh, advantageous zones? Uh, uh, particularly because uh, with this advantageous zone, it could lead to, to higher production cost and limited exposure to technical expertise. But when they are part and parcel of the zones, then it means there will be those advantages uh, that this uh, master 
that that this uh, master plan could talk to to the to to the to the uh, small suppliers. Uh, for 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 example, let's talk about the provincial e electricity pricing and consistent power supply. A typical benefit to this special economic zones. So it will be important to to get a sense in terms of uh, uh, from the, the the DTI process. Uh, uh, this administrative burden that sometimes inhibit small enterprises uh, is there a targeted approach to ensure that uh, there is a driven approach to to bring this uh, small 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 suppliers on board. Uh, the difficulty that we have is that this small supplier sometimes uh, has a, a limited administrative capacity. Uh, uh, you could uh, 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 relate to a number of areas, whether it is a, a pure issue of administration, whether it is VAT, uh, whether it is a, a refunds, uh, whether it is uh, incentive schemes. Uh, but I think the point that I'm making is we need to be able to ensure that uh, there is a that is the will uh, that is displayed by by the uh, by the team uh, to be able to ensure that uh, 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 the automotive visions and objective is stated uh, it has the will to to target uh, or even implement regulations uh, that will be able to ensure that uh, uh, we confront this inefficiency inefficiencies of structures and systems that can be able to, 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 to leverage those opportunities within the small sector. Uh, <clears throat> other than that, I think the other point that I thought I must raise here is the, is the fact that uh, uh, definitely there will be areas that one is looking at in terms of uh, uh, transformation and also in terms of the local content, which I have identified as the key areas of interest, uh, because there it means uh, we would want to hear the department talking about uh, what is it that they will do to implement uh, entrepreneurial competency in the industry. Uh, you talked about skills development, which definitely uh, relates to the approach to target. Uh, targeted approach in terms of education and training, which obviously can lead to successful uh, uh, SME policy within the sector. Uh, thirdly, I think uh, the, uh, the support should also be differentiated by sector, whether it is term in terms of size, whether it's in terms of skills, uh, whether, it in whether it is in terms of, uh, in terms of experience. But it, it is important that even uh, in terms of depreciation, uh, uh, it will be important to hear from the department as to whether do they have the differentiated approach in terms of different stages of business growth that uh, one would expect to be taken into account if you want to to broaden uh, to broaden the, the scope in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, uh, business growth around uh, SMEs uh, within this sector. Uh, but uh, other than that, I think uh, uh, indeed uh, the, 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 the master plan uh, in, a natural, in a natural one can agree that it, it, it does appreciate the, the need for an agency around driven a meaningful uh, localization. And uh, uh, what will be important uh, is uh, the, uh, the the local automotive industry that is able to grow beyond our borders. How what is it that we can do to be able to tap into the African Continental Trade Agreement, uh, particularly starting at the regional level? I think that will be quite important as as as, as a window of opportunity in terms of growth, uh, because it is important that uh, uh, we appreciate that look the policy 
the plans and the legislation alone uh, uh, is not enough. But I think what is quite key uh, from me is uh, uh, the will, is, is the volume, is the upskilling that has to be across the world to unlock the pot full potential of the local automotive industry. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mima. Uh, Honorable Django. Thank you very much, Chair. Honorable Moimang, being intelligence, have taken more, most of my questions. <laughs> However, I want to emphasize on, on one area, Chairperson, is low carbon emission production for the overseas market where we're exporting to now becomes important. So that means we're going to have to retool internally uh, to, 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 to do that. Having said that, if we're looking at low carbon emissions for export to Europe, are we then not also having to look at low carbon emissions locally and in the African continent? Uh, now, if we're going in that direction, is there enough filling stations and fuel to supply and to support uh, these kind of things? Uh, if we put more pressure onto the electricity uh, supply grid, it could actually create a further problem. Um, then I think the chairperson, the, the question of localization becomes very, very important is the manufacture of parts and components in South Africa for export one and for local manufacture two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Dango. Honorable Long. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, thank you. I'll make sure that I am slightly shorter than Honorable Moi Mang. So uh, there's a uh, um, one particular um, slide that and section in a slide that triggered my interest um, and it's about the infrastructure development specifically about the the um, analysis of the port efficiency and the rail efficiency and if um, and and you correctly pointed out uh, the presentation was a bit sketch on details and it's that one specifically that I want to ask if they can elaborate a little bit on um, by when will this analysis of the port and the rail efficiency be done um, because it's one of the um, arteries that can really help our econ economy to to develop and to grow and then also will it all be released at once or will it be released bit by bit and if it's the latter um, can we get an indication of which provinces or which ports and um, uh, rail networks will be assessed first, um, especially in our metros? That that uh, and if it's going to link to our um, the mobility in our metros and the people affected there. So that's the one that really triggered me, um, Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable uh, Long. Are there any other hands? Oh, okay, um, maybe from me then um, I've got some a few questions also to ask. I don't know if perhaps uh, uh, we we the 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 report could have uh, also uh, given us uh, the link or the relationship uh, between uh, the the master plan and the uh, MITP as well as the APTP, so that we, we have an understanding of uh, the differences uh, with regard to these uh, the programs and the plans. What is it that is new uh, in the master plan uh, that has not been done uh, in the programs, uh, be it uh, the MITP or the APTP? Uh, if, if 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 you can just uh, clarify for us uh, the the relationship, uh, I I just assume that uh, those programs I may be wrong. Uh, those programs, the MIDP, which were then uh, replaced by the APDP, were actually dealing with the same issues uh, that uh, the the master plans uh, of the automotive sector is now dealing with. Uh, 
and uh, and and if that is a case, um, I, I I I therefore do not really see uh, much progress uh, taking into account that there has been these programs before, and now you have master plans because. Now, when you talk about 2035, it's a long time. I don't know if I'll still be alive, uh, but it, these are not for me in, in the first place. Uh, um, uh, it's too far, uh, 2035. Uh, they, they, they say a revolutionary is a perpetual optimist, honorable chairperson. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I would be more interested on uh, what is going to be happening. Because in my understanding, in terms of uh, the reimagined uh, industrial strategy, that, that strategy is about also uh, creating jobs now, uh, not in 2035. Um, I, th I think at the center uh, of the reimagined uh, uh, industrial strategy would be to create uh, jobs uh, because uh, we, we have challenges uh, of, uh, of jobs uh, currently. So it's a bit disappointing when we talk about the vision 2035, and uh, and uh, when you talk, when you see uh, what is happening, what has been achieved uh, so far, uh, uh, still a process. Uh, uh, for example, talking about the identification of um, a components uh, that are going to form part, uh, say, of the localization framework of the industry which is a target of 60%. Um, now, even with regard to that, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, areas that are focused on, uh, you're making example about the carpets. Uh, we thought that you'll be talking too much actually about the parts um, of the car, not just, not just uh, carpets and uh, all those small things. Uh, given also that uh, these are companies uh, uh, from, say, for example, Mercedes-Benz, uh, BMW, uh, VW, these are German-owned uh, uh, brands. And uh, there's a tendency with these uh, 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 countries of being proud, even with those carpets, they, they will want uh, those to be identified with their uh, origin countries of origin. Uh, I don't know if it won't be even difficult uh, to even have those carpets uh, made locally, given, I mean, I, I from the Eastern Cape, uh, I know VW and Mercedes-Benz, I don't know if there's any change now, even with the uh, managing directors uh, of those companies, uh, if one is retiring, they would get another one from Germany. Uh, they won't advertise here in, in the country, uh, you know, uh, for a managing director. They would want a managing director straight from Germany to come and uh, manage uh, their plants here in South Africa. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying <laughs> I'm, I'm doubtful if we, they would uh, even want uh, uh, some of the components uh, to be made locally uh, in their own cars. But the the uh, but also linked to this issue of uh, automotives, uh, I mean uh, MIDP and uh, APDP. Um, I know, for example, we're still going to uh, get a, a, a briefing on the poultry uh, already in the presentation of the poultry in terms of the institutional ar arrangement. Uh, there's a council uh, that is responsible for monitoring uh, the implementation. Uh, of the pillars uh, of the of the poultry sector uh, master plans, um, and I see here in the presentation that uh, uh, it's, it's a matter that is still being considered. It's, there's no concept as far as uh, the presentation uh, is informing us. Um, yet, for me, it, I mean, the automotive sector should have been there. It, I think it is a first. Uh, to have a master plan. Uh, beside the master plan, there have been programs around the uh, uh, automotive sector, those that uh, I've mentioned. Uh, so I don't know, in, in terms of institutional man, uh, arrangement, how were those programs uh, being monitored and evaluated uh, in the absence uh, of a, 
a, a council in the in, 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 as an example of uh, the poultry uh, uh, sector. <clears throat> the uh, what I would also be interested in is uh, is the what how much is government uh, uh, putting uh, to ensure the success of the automotive uh, 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 sector, and also in terms of uh, uh, the value chain, uh, those that are, are also part uh, of the of the sector itself. Uh, uh, if you go down, including the SMMEs, uh, whether they 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 getting anything, but also whether uh, the funding goes to each company or it goes to a cluster. Um, or, or is it going to each of the companies that are part of uh, uh, the automotive sector? Um, we, in, in the report itself, uh, with regard to the transformation fund, we're expecting that you would give us a breakdown uh, in terms of the fund, uh, how much goes to which uh, uh, companies in each of the provinces. Um, yeah, that, that kind of uh, an, an update. Uh, but also the the issue, uh, I think Honorable Lund also spoke to that, but I, I think I must repeat it because I also raised this matter uh, when the department came to present their annual performance plans. Uh, uh, the issue, of, for example, of a uh, Buffalo City municipality, uh, where, we, I mean, Mercedes-Benz is one of the biggest exporters uh, but the the port that uh, they rely on, uh, Transnet has not invested in that uh, port for 50 years. Uh, how then do you ensure the success? Uh, I know um, um, I was informed that on Thursday there's a launch of a, a new C class there, uh, but I'm sure those are the issues that are, uh, the Buffalo City Municipality will also be raising. Uh, how do you link up? With the entities such as a, a, a Portnet or Transnet, Transnet, which is a parent company, uh, so that uh, they also assist in ensuring that uh, this master plan uh, succeed. You, you also spoke about uh, the importation of imp importation of uh, used vehicle by uh, some uh, countries in our region. Uh, I just want to find out with regard to the. Africa uh, continental free trade area, whether that that part is not included in in the in the agreement, uh, so that uh, those countries uh, stop uh, and then importing uh, uh, these uh, used cars uh, from outside the the continent. Um, the other issue, okay. What is a possibility? Because uh, here we're talking about uh, the the assembly of, of uh, uh, these cars. What is a possibility uh, other than this uh, electric car that uh, I mean was talked about? I remember the the president of uh, Azapo was a minister uh, of science and top technology. That's that's the time we're talking about this electric car. And they left uh, and nothing happened then after that. And again, we're still talking about electric car. I don't know if it will ever, will ever get it. Um, but my question is not related to electric car, but my question is uh, whether there's a possibility of South Africa uh, making its own uh, brand uh, other than just uh, uh, assembling uh, uh, cars that are from other countries. Uh, can South Africa have its own? Are there any plans, uh, you know, within the sector itself and also from uh, with the support of government uh, for for us to make our own cars? But also with regard to this, because you you had a group uh, of uh, of uh, manufacturers. Uh, uh, in your slide, I think the first few slides. Uh, but most of uh, the, the the companies that are in South Africa, uh, they are. I think the the, the 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 I think the reason why they 
now there's this competition uh, from uh, uh, other countries like China, uh, South Korea. Uh, it, it's because they, they, they target uh, the high income earning groups. Uh, unlike uh, uh, these uh, countries like China, uh, like Korea, where the, the cars uh, that they make uh, mainly uh, uh, would target uh, the, the, also the group that is not earning that high. Uh, if you look at the, the, the Daihatsu, the Honda, the, I know some support is a bit, uh, actually belong to the high class as well, uh, but Hyundai, Kia, uh, the Tata, Mahindra. Uh, but I don't know if these uh, companies like the Mercedes-Benz or BMW, uh, okay, to a certain extent, uh, Phosphafen uh, uh, would also make uh, polos uh, that at least, uh, I would say, are, are less than 500,000. Uh, but uh, you, you know you can't get a Mercedes Benz, the BMW that is uh, less than five hundred thousand these days. My question would be: Can they also, where you can have a Mercedes Benz uh, at a price range uh, that is lower, uh, uh, so that you also target uh, that market instead of having these uh, other uh, 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 brands that are coming from overseas just to be sold. Uh, in South Africa, but they are not being assembled here in South Africa. Can these uh, uh, companies also consider uh, also targeting? Uh, because most of them now they tend to be exported uh, because uh, of the price range. Uh, yeah. So for me, I think those are the questions uh, as well. Um, yeah, in addition to the questions that have been raised by uh, the honourable members. Thank you very much. I don't know if uh, the other members uh, would like to ask questions before we ask uh, uh, Sister Andy and uh, Kululi to respond. Yeah, back to you, Sister Andy. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, can I request that Mukululi start uh, and then I will come in after he has responded. Thanks. Okay, Kululi. Um, thank you, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> honorable Chair, let me start uh, with uh, Honorable Maiman's uh, questions on new energy vehicles. Uh, in the main, uh, we're looking at electric vehicles, however, that also includes hybrids of all kinds. It might also include uh, fuel cell uh, vehicles. And uh, in uh, the work that we do there, we are working uh, through the green transport strategy with the Department of Transport. Uh, however, also the department uh, that also is responsible for the environment uh, is a partner in that. Uh, so on the implementation of the green transport strategy, you would find uh, that uh, there's a joint uh, reporting on work that we are doing. Of course, uh, us will be focusing on the policy support uh, to mainly produce, uh, but also to allow on our roads, uh, those uh, new energy vehicles. Uh, yes, uh, the issue of alignment of policy is quite key and important, which is why, uh, the work on new energy vehicles also includes other stakeholders like uh, your department uh, that also deals with the science and technology uh, that also would include uh, some of the uh, educational facilities like uh, uh, the Nelson Mandela uh, Metropolitan University in which uh, UYI Law Initiative is based and uh, we, you know, by the way, they inherited uh, some of the products and machinery uh, that was made uh, by uh, uh, Optimal Energy whilst they were trying to come up with a local electric vehicle, the Joule. Uh, we also working in close collaboration with ESCOM 
as they are studying the, the impact of uh, these electric vehicle fleets on uh, um, the, the electricity grid, uh, which is why they are also beginning to think about uh, smart meters, where uh, through which uh, you would encourage people to charge at uh, certain times uh, of peak, uh, rather than charging at peak uh, to uh, overwhelm uh, the system. So yes, uh, it is uh, our it is uppermost in our minds that uh, government policy should be aligned with all the various agencies and departments uh, that are involved. Uh, coming to localization, uh, uh, on localization, uh, yes, uh, on the stimulating uh, demand. Uh, we are looking at, uh, as I indicated, uh, on uh, preferential procurement of light motor vehicles by the state. It is something that we are exploring. Uh, it's not an easy one, it's quite complicated, uh, but uh, uh, we see a reason why we should uh, further explore that. And uh, to that extent, we've already implemented uh, preferential procurement on uh, buses, where we expect that uh, by value, at least 80% of bus bodies uh, should be locally built. Uh, there, there will be a different uh, kind of level on uh, light motor vehicles, of course. Uh, we also uh, designated for local procurement your uh, fire engines, uh, uh, amongst others. And we're looking at uh, also the yellow metals or uh, the front end loaders and uh, the such. So it is something that we're looking at to address uh, localization uh, opportunities there. And uh, in terms of location of uh, firms, be they large or small, uh, you would notice that uh, uh, there are a, a number of uh, uh, production hubs or parks that uh, were created starting with the Roslin one, uh, which is uh, in Roslin managed by the AIDC, uh, where a number of uh, suppliers that would uh, supply in the main uh, uh, closer to them, a BMW, a Nissan, and a uh, Ford, not so far, but they also supply other OEMs in other provinces and uh, being located in such uh, uh, automotive parks uh, uh, deals with some of the efficiencies that they would need uh, to improve on, uh, like training and so on. Uh, so uh, there, there are such initiatives, uh, which is why also working with uh, uh, the Nelson Mandela Bay Council then, uh, there was uh, the establishment of an um, Auto park close to VW in uh, Edina, uh, uh, where the component suppliers are located uh, not far from the OEM to improve uh, logistics efficiency uh, to such a point that they can supply just in time to uh, VW. Uh, as well as uh, the recent one, most recent one is. Uh, uh, the SEZ uh, uh, in Swane around the fort, uh, which is set to house a number of suppliers to fort. Uh, those suppliers, some of them uh, would be coming in from abroad, some of them would be relocating from wherever they are so that they are close to fort and be able to supply just in time and be able to ensure that uh, there's a, a improved communication uh, between themselves and uh, the OEM that they supply to. So the industrial zones, uh, especially economic zones, uh, are being looked at for improved efficiency. You would know that uh, in Goha, there's quite a number of uh, component uh, company, uh, automotive companies, as well as uh, in uh, East London, uh, where there's a lot of uh, component suppliers to Mercedes-Benz located uh, in there and uh, they are able to supply uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, uh, more efficiently. However, uh, some would still uh, prefer to be outside of those zones for a variety of reasons. Some you would find that uh, they manage to acquire land 
uh, more efficiently outside uh, and so on. Uh, for example, there's one company that's uh, just uh, uh, set up base in Berlin uh, around East London. Uh, they had the options, but uh, on evaluation, they decided that uh, Berlin is a better uh, place for them to, to locate. So there, there are such uh, things. In terms of supporting uh, uh, component suppliers, SMM is in this space. Uh, as I indicated, we have an initiative uh, which is uh, formed and uh, which was formed and jointly led by uh, the DTIC, uh, NUMSA, NACAM, and NAMSA. Uh, that is the component suppliers as well as. Uh, uh, the vehicle assemblers, which looks at uh, shop floor level interventions, uh, your Kaizen's or continuous improvement at the shop floor. Uh, over time, we have now uh, uh, changed the focus to have a specific focus on black suppliers uh, so that we assist uh, the potential black suppliers in this industry to improve uh, uh, they are manufacturing processes, uh, train their uh, managers also, uh, equip them uh, to be able to supply in this industry because it is quite a finicky industry. Uh, quality deviations uh, are not uh, 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 kind of uh, allowed or tolerated. So we have such uh, initiatives. And also working with the Japanese, we've managed to bring in their experts on, on such programs like Kaizen uh, to come and uh, assist our engineers based at the AIDC and elsewhere to train them uh, so that they are able then to intervene at the shop floor level, assisting uh, uh, component manufacturers in the main to improve their efficiencies. Uh, however, at the moment, we don't have differentiated support per se uh, for uh, SMMEs and other larger ones uh, by and large. Uh, if you invest in productive assets, uh, you get what is due to you, whatever percentage, uh, depending on the investment and uh, whether you're supplying the OE, uh, I mean, uh, the, the suppliers uh, or uh, the vehicle assemblers uh, at that level, there's no differentiation. But in terms of the shop floor interventions, those are in the main targeted at uh, smaller component suppliers because internally uh, the OEMs and other large uh, first tier suppliers uh, that happen to be multinational, they have internal capacity that they can tap into. Coming to uh, Honorable Dango. Uh, as I indicated uh, on uh, the new energy vehicles or low carbon emissions, uh, the idea is to localize uh, the production of uh, such vehicles uh, in the end, so that we may be able to continue to supply uh, the export market, uh, but also locally. However, we understand that with any new technologies, the investments have taken place elsewhere where there was uh, uh, quite uh, significant support for such development. Areas such as China have been uh, pumping in uh, uh, serious resources into the development of uh, uh, EVs. Uh, however, also uh, companies in Europe and so on. So we would find that uh, in the beginning, as we have now, uh, we're importing uh, the electric vehicles that are on our road. Uh, the, the Nissan Leaf, uh, the BMW i3, uh, the Jaguar i uh, amongst others. Uh, there are more that are coming in, but our interest is on localizing the production of those vehicles and their components uh, in the country. As I say, we're working with uh, ESCOM uh, so that uh, we can ensure that uh, uh, electricity is not overwhelmed, but also uh, for improved uh, low carbon emissions. But these vehicles themselves uh, emit low carbon. Uh, I mean, it would only be on the tires if they hit uh, the tarmac. Uh, but uh, if uh, these uh, charging stations can be charged using greener energy sources like solar, 
then uh, uh, there's more contribution there. It doesn't help much if we're still uh, using fossil fuel to get our electricity that goes into these vehicles. So these are some of the issues that are being uh, uh, explored and investigated. Uh, on infrastructure development and the uh, real and port study, uh, at, at the moment, as I say, we're almost done uh, with the studies. Uh, um, the idea was for this to be worked through the, the, the appropriate working group such that uh, we can then uh, identify or develop uh, the requisite uh, interventions and uh, present to the EOC for adoption. And then we work on that to make sure that the appropriate intervention uh, is uh, delivered um, for, for these, uh, 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 the, 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 both the ports and the rails are improved. And uh, in doing so, we're working with uh, academics uh, that are leading these studies and uh, in consultation with uh, a Transnet, of course. Uh, however, in due course, uh, uh, we will be able to uh, report on uh, what has transpired uh, uh, and uh, what then uh, would be the interventions developed. The idea is that uh, uh, during this calendar year, at least on one of uh, uh, these uh, uh, areas, uh, there's, there's a, a tangible work that has been uh, interrogated, that's been properly looked into, uh, that uh, then uh, uh, we can share. Uh, these working groups uh, meet uh, quarterly uh, for now. Uh, and uh, each working group is uh, chaired by a CEO of one of the uh, uh, vehicle assemblers with participation from uh, the other key stakeholders, including other stakeholders such as your ESCOMs, uh, Transnet, uh, and MSR. Uh, we will, uh, uh, as the details come through, share such. Uh, uh, coming to uh, APDP and the master plan. Uh, in the past, uh, since uh, the MITP days, we really didn't have an overarching policy or framework uh, uh, for, for supporting the autos. The program itself became the uh, uh, major uh, part of us supporting the industry. Over time, there was this realization that, uh, yes, you have uh, the APDP, for example, but it doesn't address everything that is required uh, to grow uh, and sustain the auto industry. Uh, the APDP, with its four major elements, uh, talks to rewarding uh, local production uh, at various levels of local content but uh, it doesn't really talk to how you're gonna uh, encourage or assist the industry to transform. It doesn't talk to how you're gonna assist uh, the industry to have the requisite skills uh, amongst others. So the idea is that you have uh, the master plan that looks at a variety of uh, issues that are required to support this industry, uh, to grow the industry. However, the APDP remains a key component of uh, the interventions uh, for, 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 for the industry. So it is part of uh, the, the master plan, but uh, there are other elements like I indicated, regional market development, localization efforts, transformation, uh, an approach to new technologies, uh, to skills, uh, that uh, are beyond the APDP as we have it. Uh, so that would be the relationship that uh, the APDP is a key component uh, of uh, uh, the interventions that we have under the master plan. And uh, in terms of uh, an oversight uh, structure, as I indicated that uh, the executive oversight committee uh, started working uh, in 2019 under the leadership or chairpersonship of the Minister of uh, DTIC. 
and uh, around the table sits uh, the uh, MDs of uh, the uh, various uh, uh, OEMs of vehicle assemblers, uh, sits representatives from the component suppliers, sits the leadership of uh, Labour, NOMSA, uh, and of course the officials from the department in the Executive Oversight Committee. Uh, of course, also uh, the departmental agency, ITAC, which is quite instrumental uh, in the, the implementation of uh, the APDP. In the, the, the EOC has got the six working groups, seven rather, working groups that are looking on uh, local market optimization up to skills uh, development. Uh, those uh, working groups report to the Executive Oversight Committee. Uh, and those uh, work streams are chaired by uh, the MDs of the various OEMs and in them uh, sits uh, leadership from the various uh, key stakeholders. And in the working groups, <coughs> there is participation of other stakeholders that are not part of the key core stakeholders there would be, you would find a Transnet, a Department of Transport, a National Treasury, and, uh, and so on, uh, depending on the uh, specific uh, uh, working group. So uh, that's how uh, the institutional arrangement uh, is uh, at the moment. Uh, how much is government putting? Uh, in terms of a budget, uh, the, the major element that has a, a budget is the automotive investment scheme, uh, which is, uh, has been roughly over, just over around a billion rand a year. Because remember, the, that uh, kind of supports the investments. So if you invest 100 rand, you might get uh, 20 to 30 rand back payable over a three year period from start of production. So that's, uh, that caters for such uh, investment support. Uh, and the, the other element of uh, the APDP is uh, where the benefit accrues uh, to the participants in the form of duty credits. Uh, duty credits that they can use to offset imports. Uh, those through the volume assembly allowance or through the production incentive, uh, it's calculated a different formula and uh, you get at the end of it a rebate certificate that you can use against uh, in, instead of paying a duty on other vehicles that you produce or components that you import. Remember, uh, when, uh, when the MIDP was formulated, the idea was uh, we understood that uh, not all the components uh, that go into a vehicle assembly in South Africa will be manufactured locally for a variety of reasons. You find that uh, there are global suppliers of such a part and they would mostly be located uh, closer to where most volumes are. So you have a plant in South Africa producing 100,000 vehicles a year but uh, you have uh, another plant elsewhere in Europe that produces uh, five times that. So it makes sense for a supplier to, uh, to locate close to where the most volume goes and then export to other uh, smaller uh, plants uh, elsewhere. And uh, so we said, well, uh, to deal with such, and we understand we're quite far from uh, markets in terms of uh, components and so on, we will allow uh, you to offset duties on those components. But also through uh, starting with the MIDP, we encouraged uh, uh, a situation where a local plant doesn't manufacture everything that they need to distribute locally. Before 94, you will find that uh, some of the plants here would be a BMW would be making all sorts of uh, series vehicles uh, that only would uh, be distributed locally. And uh, one other encouragement for such was uh, the high tariffs that were there, more than 100% uh, at some stage of import duties. 
so if you bring in a car from outside, you'd be paying a double its value just to get it into the car. I mean, into the country. So uh, it made sense then to just uh, assemble for the local market, even if it's two vehicles in a year, just to satisfy the uh, local market. However, we encouraged them to focus on uh, models that they can produce at relatively high volumes and import the rest. Hence, you find a Mercedes-Benz uh, only making the C-class sedan in South Africa and importing uh, the rest, your A-class, B-class, uh, the C-class coupe, uh, E-class, and so on, are imported because those are sold in relatively low volumes in the country. So they produce the C-class, but uh, upwards of 80% of that they export. And with the rebates they earn, they use against the imports. So it makes business sense for them. Now, that is not real money that uh, uh, is given to them, but uh, based on their uh, uh, business model, uh, their production uh, uh, volumes, uh, they gain their rebates uh, based on the volumes and uh, local content, then they use against uh, uh, imports. And also in setting up the MIDP, a special dissertation uh, to which components for vehicle assemblers would be imported through was created in order to create this duty pool that can then be offset by the rebates. Under chapter 98, uh, that's uh, where uh, the vehicle assemblers import their components. The duties there are currently at 20% uh, of value. Uh, this uh, came down on, uh, from uh, uh, 50s uh, as we commenced with the MITP in 95. The, the, the duties were relatively high also on vehicles, but over time they went to the levels they are at and uh, since 2012, we kept them constant at 25% for light motor vehicles and 20% for the components. That is components for vehicle assembly. Otherwise, if uh, you and me import uh, any component, there would be a specific tariff that is applicable. In many instances, you find that the levels, uh, the duty levels are very low from zero to about 5% and so on. Uh, so to create this duty pool, uh, the duties were uh, bumped up uh, so that they can then earn these rebates uh, to offset the duties on their imports. Uh, so that, that talking uh, value, uh, the value of those uh, rebates uh, in a year would run into billions, uh, depending on performance of the industry from year to year. But those would be rebates that uh, whose value is only realizable on uh, off, on on the instance of offsetting a duty on imports. If you don't use it uh, after a year, it expires. So it it, it has uh, you realize its value only at the instance when you offset a duty uh, on it. Uh, on the AITF, uh, we can, uh, we didn't prepare a breakdown on that. We'll have uh, uh, at a given point in time be able to provide a breakdown on uh, what companies, where are they uh, that have been supported. Uh, this uh, fund is independently uh, administered. It has its own board uh, and offices and the such. Uh, but we can uh, provide uh, the details uh, in due course uh, on the breakdown. As I indicated, uh, at the moment, as of yesterday, only two were finally approved. Uh, two, there were a few issues uh, that are needed to be addressed. Uh, but uh, the, in the pipeline, there's quite a number of uh, uh, companies that are being uh, looked into. On how it works, we can... Uh, uh, provide the details. They also have their own different uh, uh, website um, where the, uh, a lot more about the, uh, about the fund is indicated. Uh, the used vehicle imports uh, is a political issue that's been uh, 
uh, not easy to address for a number of years because uh, in some of the countries, uh, the leadership there uh, feels that uh, in order to afford their citizens some degree of mobility, uh, they need to consider the importation of these used vehicles, which would uh, in the main come from the East, because in countries like uh, Japan, it becomes rather difficult to keep your car for more than three years. The taxes uh, rise uh, exponentially, uh, and that is meant to address also uh, environmental concerns. Uh, so they come uh, and are exported to various countries almost uh, next to nothing. So they're quite uh, uh, affordable uh, to acquire. Uh, and in those, in those countries, uh, the leadership feels that uh, that affords access uh, to vehicles uh, for, for their citizens. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, they, they continue to support them. However, we've seen in the recent past following uh, engagements with uh, officials and the politicians that some countries are starting to limit uh, the importation of used vehicles, at least by year where now the limiting that uh, you can't import a vehicle that's older than eight years, for example. Uh, and they're starting to put duties so that uh, uh, the new vehicles that they assemble can uh, have a chance in the market. So it is a, 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 a thorny political issue. Uh, hence uh, the idea of having bilateral arrangements with specific countries where we can encourage uh, policy alignment uh, as it uh, also affects the market there. Uh, on a South African branded car, uh, uh, there's, there's been a, a number of attempts uh, at that. Uh, uh, it is a, a thorny issue in that in the mass market, our market is uh, dominated uh, by global companies. Uh, with the introduction of the MIDP, we as a country, as a government, actively encouraged uh, uh, the OEMs uh, globally to buy back and fully own uh, the local uh, assembly uh, plants. You would remember that in the past, uh, there was a high degree of local share, shareholding, for example, in Toyota, the Vessel family, uh, in Ford, in VW, and others. Uh, however, that uh, with the seven year cycle of each model became a problem in some instances in terms of investing uh, for new models. Uh, look at it, uh, for example, Mercedes Benz, yes, uh, they are launching the new C class on Thursday, uh, which uh, means the end of the W205, the current model, which has been in the market for seven years. They have invested for the current model about 6 billion rand. For the new model, they've invested 13 billion rand and they have started investing about three years ago. Now, even before you make uh, or you get your dividends, you'd be expected to also uh, uh, contribute your share uh, uh, of that investment that is required. And for locals, uh, not only in South Africa, but uh, globally, that proved to be a, a bit of a challenge uh, for local ownership. However, uh, uh, to address such issues in South Africa, we agreed on this uh, transformation fund as a form of an equity equivalent. But uh, that then uh, say, begins to say, uh, we can't avoid the dominance uh, of global uh, marquees or brands uh, in the country. Uh, whilst there may be a few locally developed vehicles, but uh, they are not uh, mass produced, I know there are two companies in the free state that uh, uh, developed their own vehicles. One is a, a high-end sports vehicle, uh, which sells for millions. Uh, they're selling overseas. 
uh, and they produce a few handmade few uh, vehicles uh, in a time period. And the other one also they're looking at uh, uh, a mini truck uh, that uh, has uh, significant off-road capabilities, but those are low volume vehicles. Uh, so the issue is uh, in the market, uh, because it is a global market, uh, it is rather tough, uh, but uh, it's, it's nothing that has been closed, but uh, the resources required to commence a vehicle production can be quite significant. Um, when uh, Optimal Energy was looking at uh, com uh, commercially producing the jewel, for example, they were looking at a support that uh, would have come close to 10 billion rand just to set up. <coughs> so uh, there are challenges, but uh, it is possible, but uh, the, uh, the resource requirements are quite huge without any surety on the market uh, is a success uh, at the end. Uh, when we commenced the MIDP in 95, part of it was a, a small vehicle incentive uh, where there was a, a more support for firms that produce uh, uh, entry level or cheaper vehicles. Uh, I think there was a recommended retail price limit of 30,000 then. Uh, However, uh, within a few years, there was no uptake of such. Uh, why? Uh, for, for many of the local vehicle assemblers, uh, it became more lucrative or better prospects of, a pro of making a profit, uh, producing the medium and luxury vehicles rather than the small vehicles. And jurisdictions such as India uh, became popular with uh, making the small vehicle, uh, most small entry level vehicles. Hence, many of them for a number of brands uh, are produced in uh, countries such as India. The margins there, the profit margins uh, are quite a very low uh, and therefore the reliance is on volumes. Uh, as against uh, the vehicles that are made, the, uh, for example, by Mercedes and uh, BMW, which are luxury vehicles, and therefore the scope for a markup there are quite uh, large, uh, so they can still make uh, the uh, local plants uh, profitable. Uh, hence, uh, they don't produce uh, entry-level vehicles um, in the country. Uh, and uh, even the likes of uh, Toyotas and, and stuff uh, make some of their vehicles and the Fords uh, in, the, in areas such as India because uh, of uh, uh, the advantages they have on the labor front and generally the cost of production uh, uh, is affected by a variety of uh, uh, components that, that go into it. Uh, so, with that, uh, thank you. On the details uh, in terms of infrastructure development and the AITF, we will uh, 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 provide uh, such information uh, going forward uh, in more details and uh, hoping that uh, as well, um, uh, we will be able to have a more detailed uh, document or presentation uh, for the next engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, uh, Ms. Pele. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, I think Kululu was quite comprehensive in his response. Just to add three points on my part, uh, I think touching on Honorable Moemeng and Donga's point around policy coherence, I think we all accepting that uh, in this market, in order for you to transition quickly and be able to adapt to new technologies, uh, it's important that uh, we work in a cohesive manner. Uh, as Mkulilu was alluding that the changes in the technology are mainly driven in Europe, 
is because of environmental consideration and regulations that have been introduced from a transport perspective that is enabling the development of technologies in eco-mobility. So indeed, uh, uh, that point is very important. And I think linking to the question around what is our, uh, our intention on the continent to, to really develop this uh, uh, industry, I think it's important we also talk about in an inhabited area, we talk about I guess, let me put it like that, but to get from the countries that we will demonstrate, I guess the limitations that are being uh, presented by continuous importation of second-hand vehicles, we are able to have a better conversation that is more coherent around how we can drive a policy program for the continent that can enable us to really increase our manufacturing uh, footprint and be able to develop the regional uh, value chains. Um, the second point that I want to raise, I think Chair talked about the timing of 2035. Um, the issue of the, the timing is important in this sector because as Mukurilu was alluding, a model normally lasts for seven years. In the seven years, you can have uh, face lifts, but the main uh, body of the car doesn't really change that much. So if we are really wanting to really increase uh, local content and be able to integrate more SMEs and um, black suppliers and be able to really support sustainable suppliers in this supply chain, it's important that we really take into account the timing thereof, that we are able to introduce these things timelessly because once we are in the middle of a model build, it's very difficult to really introduce the new nuances uh, going forward. So that's where the, 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 30, the 2035 uh, is coming from to say in the, in the two cycles that we can produce uh, going forward, how can we really embed the localization and transformation in a manner that is much more uh, sustainable? Um, on Honorable Lloyd, uh, question around infrastructure, I think we really talked about uh, our ambition to increase our overall uh, local production of vehicles. Um, and many of these uh, OEMs are inland, and therefore, as we are increasing our, uh, uh, our production, we need to ensure that we are able to have. Uh, to have a supportive infrastructure, be it from a, a locomotives, uh, wagons perspective, to be able to move from uh, traffic from road to rail uh, in a manner that is actually cost effective also for the OEMs and the component suppliers. So um, I think it's an important conversation that we need to be having. I think this is the point about the master plan. The master plan is about bringing all social partners to the table to talk about common problems and opportunities into the sector. In the past, it has been the DTI that has been driving the sector work, you know, and we will call on our SOEs, our other sister department as and when, and that's the, the difference in the master plan. In the master plan, we are saying we need to identify the problems up front as a collective and work through the issues systematically. So as Ford is talking about producing more than 200,000 uh, parties going forward, this bank is majority of them are exported. So therefore, we need to have an infrastructure in land that can take this uh, uh to the ports um, and be able to be exported. So both the issue of rail efficiency and port efficiencies are much more important to the sector. And I think she made an example about the Mercedes-Benz being very close to a port, but yet the port is not responsive to the needs of the OEM. So we, 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 we want to move away from where the SOEs uh, make the investment on their own and hoping that the customers will come. And we are saying that let's work with the customer and be able to make the right investment in the infrastructure from the branch line to the general freight and also to the way we do port handling um, uh, at the ports it itself so that we are able to really facilitate um, uh, exports much more competitively. So, Chair, those are the points I wanted to complement on the ones that Mukulij has already made. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if uh, honorable members would like to make uh, follow up questions. Um, okay, not. Um, now, let me take this opportunity then to thank you, uh, uh, 
in DDG, but also as uh, we indicated, uh, we will appreciate uh, if we could also get uh, another presentation, which is uh, much more detailed uh, without necessarily waiting for uh, the next meeting, because uh, we might not uh, call you again because of a uh, uh, number of uh, issues that we deal with, uh, with the department, but also with other departments uh, that report to this uh, select committee because we have other, altogether we have four departments with their entities. It's a DTIC, a Department of Tourism, Department of Employment and Labor, and the Department of Small Business uh, Development. So, uh, but I'm not going to give you timelines for now, uh, but it's a matter that uh, the our committee secretaries and the PLO uh, will uh, follow up. Um, yeah, so that was thank you very much. Can we then get uh, the poultry uh, master plan uh, pr presentation? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I was not sure I was going to lead it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair, and um, good afternoon, um, Chair, yeah. and good afternoon, honorable members and um, colleagues. My name is Ngomim Klauli from the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition. I'm responsible for the agro-processing sector. Chair, I must indicate that it is so difficult to present after Mkululi, but I'll try to run through the, uh, the presentation as quick as possible, Chair, just to make sure that uh, uh, I give an opportunity to members to ask uh, questions and comments. Um, yes. Actually, I forgot to give uh, uh, Mr. Mlota a bit time, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because he went on and on, and I, uh, I felt guilty <laughs> that I didn't uh, tell him how much time I was giving to him. So I couldn't yeah. stop him, uh, but I'm giving you 20 minutes. Okay, Chair. No, I'll try to finish before a uh, 20 oh, minutes, Chair. Really um, th thank you, Chair, once again. Um, in terms of my presentation, this is the presentation outline. I think it's more or less similar to what has been uh, presented by Mkululi. Then can I move now to the next slide? Uh, in terms of the executive summary, um, as a DDG has indicated earlier on that, uh, this is basically um, the master plan uh, was actually, um, I mean, was developed in close uh, partnership between uh, the government, number of stakeholders, including the poultry producers, processors, exporters, uh, including the importers, and as well as the organized labor. These are the number of few social partners that have been involved in terms of the development of the master plan, including, by the way, the the large uh, and the small uh, producers. And then uh, the whole process uh, culminated in the official sign off uh, by all social partners at the, uh, the, the master plan was signed at the South African uh, Investment Conference that was held on the 8th of November, 2019. So we're almost a year and a half in terms of the implementation of the master plan. As DDG has alluded to the fact that the master plan is mainly uh, around, you know, bringing some common, you know, problems and challenges, but more importantly, the opportunities and some of the challenges that have been indicated in terms of the poultry industry, it's issues around uh, the cost of feed, uh, the issues around, you know, barriers to export, as well as rising imports, mainly of bone in chicken portion from Brazil. And then more importantly, now, Che, we've got a shortcoming of the avian uh, influenza, which has, I mean, which is mainly a big challenge that the industry has been faced with. If you remember, 2017, 2018, the industry was, uh, had an outbreak of avian influence, and now we're back again in that, um, in that sort of uh, outbreak, so which is a big challenge now the industry is faced with. But I must indicate that I'm working very closely with my colleagues from Delrat in terms of dealing with some of, of the challenges. And I must also indicate in terms of point number four that uh, through the development of the master plan, uh, there was a broad agreement that the poultry industry, it needs to adapt and be developed to weather the challenges that are brought upon by, you know, mainly the imports, the avian influenza, and so on and so forth. All the challenges that I've mentioned um, earlier on. And then um, 
um, in terms of the master plan, there are five uh, major interventions that have been agreed upon by the social partners. The first one is around expanding and improving local production. There we're talking about increasing the production levels. And then the second one, uh, intervention, major intervention is driving the domestic demand, including, by the way, the affordability of the chicken prices, at affordability of the chicken meat. And then the third uh, intervention is mainly driving export. I must indicate there's quite a lot of, I mean, input or collaboration that we have with the Department of Agriculture around the SPS issues and opening up markets for the, our chicken. And then fourth uh, intervention, it's around enhancing our regulatory framework and ensure compliance, especially the framework that is looking at uh, managing imports. And then the last intervention is trade measures to support the local industry. Next slide, please. This is the vision that the industry has set itself in terms of the master plan vision 2030, which is mainly dealing with the growing and contributing to investment growth and more importantly, the transformation of the industry. Next slide, please. Chair, I've talked about the pillars, which is on the right hand side of this uh, table, but I wanted to emphasize in order for us to realize the, the, the vision that I've talked about earlier on, there are strategic objectives that the industry has actually put in place, which is mainly the first one is to ensure that uh, we locally produce a, a product that makes up an increasing larger proportion of consumption over time. So there needs to be enough production. And then also we export at least up to three to 5% of uh, production by 20 2023 and then there's also export targets there for 2028 which is almost 7 to 10 percent of exports and then that will grow um, uh, according to the number of years and then also in terms of the output an increase of almost 10 percent within the three years and we've seen some good results in terms of the outputs now especially in terms of the poultry products which i'm going to talk about in the next slide more importantly chair increase the level of black participation particularly the ownership across the value chain and increase employment and worker share ownership in the sector. So those are the strategic objectives that uh, Chair have been set in terms of the master plan in order to realize the vision 2030 of the poultry industry master plan. Next slide, please. Um, what has been done, these are basically Chair, the highlights in terms of the poultry master plan. The first one, um, um, it's a new tariff was uh, put um, uh, in place, Chair, that is it was gazetted in, on the 13 March 2020. And then also we've seen an increase in terms of production capacity, at least now the industry is able to produce 1 million additional chickens uh, uh, every week since the new duty structure has been imposed. And then also in terms of the, again, um, we're looking at almost 145,000 tons of poultry now that is produced on a monthly basis. And then coming to the investment as a highlight, the industry committed 1.5 billion. And so far, the industry has um, allocated almost 1.15 billion, which is almost 80% of the commitments that were made uh, during 2019. And then also we've seen new jobs, almost 980 new jobs. These figures, Chair, must indicate they are only up until I think uh, the end of Jan. So, um, um, we 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 actually now uh, beginning to see some new figures in terms of uh, what uh, I mean what I've um, indicated earlier on, and then that also um, talks to the cook cooking capacity for the poultry meat exports, which have increased now by almost 65 tons per week. That is what we're exporting now in terms of cooked meat. And then in terms of the transformation of the industry now, uh, Chair, out of 50 farmers that were, I mean, indicated in terms of the target, 30 new contract growers have already been assisted with feed, with chickens, and as well as the non-financial support and technical support and veterinary. So this is a support that comes specifically from the also declared of the imports um, uh, since uh, September 2020 peak. Next slide, please. Um, coming to the issues around investment and production, especially if you look at the period between uh, January 2019 and January 2021, I must indicate that, um, you, uh, the, for example, the graph on your left indicates uh, the, the fact that uh, there's some decline in terms of, you know, uh, I would say production. Uh, I've indicated that earlier on that, um, for example, the industry is producing almost 145,000 tons of chicken per month. Uh, but if you look at October, we're sitting at almost 150,000 50,000 plus 
150,000 tons per month. And in January 2021, we have seen a decline of below 150,000 tons per month of chicken that is being produced, including, by the way, the chickens that are being slaughtered uh, on a weekly basis now. Uh, you see, for example, in January 2021, we have below at 21, below 22 million birds that are being slaughtered. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of imports, I've also indicated that there's um, a good decline in terms of uh, the, the imports. The, the imports from uh, January 20, 2021, they're down by 30% as compared to January 2020. And also, I think if you also compare with 20, uh, September 2020, when there was a peak, there's quite you know, a decline generally in terms of the imports. Uh, Chair, the next slide. Um, this is basically the investment that has been put uh, forward by the industry uh, in terms of, you know, um, uh, different, you know, projects and the location of those projects. Uh, there are more details, Chair, that we have some information. I must indicate that, Chair, we could not share with the committee at this point in time. But if the Chair would like us to share the details in terms of, you know, uh, the names of the companies. This is the investment that is being made to the large um, producers uh, as, um, in terms of, you know, the type of investment as well as the new jobs. Here we're talking about the 1.1 billion that has already been allocated by the industry. So this is mainly for the large uh, players or large producers. The next slide, please. And you would see, Chair, in terms of the coverage around the, the investment, it's in, in almost all the provinces, including, by the way, Limpombo, Houting, Northwest, and so on and so forth. Then coming to the, um, the, the pillars, Chair, I must indicate that uh, the, 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 the poultry master plan, as we have indicated earlier on, that it's actually co-chaired by both Minister uh, Togodidiza as well as Minister Patel, and we have an executive oversight committee which is looking at the progress around all these pillars. We also have the PMO office, which is led by Zuki, as well as Mahindra, a chair in terms of you know monitoring the implementation of the master plan. So we are well structured, and then we also have work, uh, work groups that are dealing with all the different pillars, uh, which are actually co-chaired or I mean which are actually chaired by the different conveners or parties from uh, I mean social partners. Then the first one it's around um, uh, the, the first work stream is around expanding uh, production. The target there is around increasing maize um, and soya by uh, 300,000 tons at the end of the year. Uh, Chair, I must indicate that the latest figures that we've got is that now we've got I think um, South Africa is producing quite uh, enough soya as well as maize, the industry has indicated that we might not need to import at this point in time, which is quite good results that we've seen in terms of, I think, over the last, uh, uh, I think, six months. And so we will be able to achieve that target of 300,000 tons of a uh, feed, which will be manufactured locally. And then the next uh, target is increased production by 1.7 million beds per week, or almost 10%. As I've indicated earlier on now, the industry is producing almost 1 million additional beds uh, per week. There's also an investment of almost 1.15 billion that is being allocated. These are mainly looking at also the transformation in the industry in terms of also supporting the small, uh, um, the supporting the small growers in the industry. And then the next uh, target is around the 50 new contract farmers. And so far, we've got 30 new contract farmers that have been supported and um, uh, through SAPA. Uh, and then also the latest figures that we've got Chair, now we. We've got also in terms of the agri-industrial fund that was launched by Minister Toko Didiza, there are six new applications that are on pipeline. We also have nine more farmers that are going to be supported through SAPA. Uh, I'm talking about now the contract growers and then and plus there's another 19 farmers that are being uh, supported by SAPA through things like EIA, things like water licenses and so on and so forth. So we're beginning to see, you know, a little bit of transformation in the industry. But Chair, I just want to indicate that uh, I, I will deal also the issues around black ownership where I want to also uh, reflect on the issues around transformation. But the 1 billion rents that has been allocated by, um, I mean, Delrat, which is administered by IDC, there's 200 million 
programs which is being set aside for the poultry industry. Fortunate enough, I've got our CASP coordinator, uh, Ms. L. Damchiza from Belrad, who can sort of elaborate around that uh, 1 billion rands, which is mainly not only for the poultry industry, for the whole agri value chain, uh, and also, by the way, the poultry uh, industry. And then in terms of skills development, I must indicate that uh, there's a draft skills uh, development. We've got Agricita on board as one of the key players in terms of the uh, skills development. And as you would know that uh, we also have the KZN Poultry Institute, which has also started a good training in terms of, I mean, providing training to the small scale farmers. And then in terms of black ownership, we've also started some work there uh, very closely with the transformation unit of DTI, where, you know, industries, especially the big players, they've started to give us, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, uh, opportunities that uh, they, they want to sort of provide to the small players. I'm talking about the big um, companies now. So we're expecting uh, that report or information in the next two days, uh, a chair from SAPA, uh, where, you know, companies um, are going to indicate what opportunities are, are, do they have for the small players, especially to mainstream the small players uh, along the value chain in terms of feed manufacturing, in terms of hatcheries, in terms of abattoirs, and so on and so forth. So that um, work is ongoing, and we're working very closely again with Delrat, as well as with IDC and SAPA to make sure that they, we've got at least the main, I mean, the process for mainstreaming of the, 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 the black players is taking place. We don't want to see our farmers only operating chair at the sort of upstream value chain. We want to make sure our farmers, they are operating across the value chain. That's why this uh, intervention is very important important for us, especially as Delrat, as well as DTIC and SAPA. The next slide, please. I've talked about the 13 farmers. This is the type of support and uh, that has been provided to those farmers. And we're busy doing now as DTIC, the farm audits, that's to make sure that what I mean, SAPA has indicated in terms of the support is indeed there, including, by the way, the offtake agreement. This is mainly the contract growers chair where they are provided with production inputs by the big companies, as well as cheeks and business plan, EIA and offtake agreement. This is a quite a very important intervention, but I think there's quite a lot of Work that we need to do in terms of looking at those, you know, contracts to make sure that they make impact in terms of, you know, improving the lives of the farmers. The next slide, please. Um, pillar number two, Chair, it's, it's about uh, driving uh, the demand, which is looking at the, the local demand, especially the state procurement. Uh, already we have finalized our submission to the minister to make sure that he approves the designation of this industry. So I'm hoping that the minister will be able to sign this shortly. And then in terms of chicken prices, again, we're monitoring uh, the chicken prices, uh, Chair, working with the NAMC to make sure that uh, the price of chicken is affordable, especially for the poorest of the poor. Now we're talking about value packs uh, together with the retailers to make sure that, you know, when communities, they go to the pick and pays and so on, they're able to buy chicken at a much more affordable, you know, prices. So we're having engagements uh, with the, the, the retailers in that regard to make sure that we're able to come up with some kind of, you know, uh, value packs, uh, especially for our communities. And then there's also campaign that is being done by Proudly SA to make sure that we promote our local uh, chicken, especially especially our local meat. Uh, so uh, proudly SA is doing quite a lot of work there. And But more importantly, Chair, to make sure that from a local procurement point of view, there is a commitment from the industry, I mean, from the retailers uh, to be able to buy our local chicken. So that engagement is ongoing, working with proudly SA as well as Consumer Goods Council. The next slide, please. Um, Chair, I want to stop here just for a second, uh, Chair, but I must indicate that this is a very important intervention that we are embarking on to make sure that our chicken were able to export to quite a number of countries, including the UAE, uh, the EU, as well as the SADC countries and the continental free trade uh, area. And it includes quite a number of work that has been put in place, including the export certificates, which are being done by Delrad, as well as detailed negotiations that are taking place and, you know, administrative work that is being done by uh, Delra to make sure that we open especially the EU market, which I think uh, the industry is targeting, especially in the EU as well as SADC, as well as the um, uh, UAE and uh, South Arabia. Can I just give a second check to, second check to, to, to Dr. Modisani around this? Okay, you can do so. 
Okay, Dr. Motisane, are you ready just to take us uh, the committee through in terms of the work that we are doing in this regard? Um, yes. Um, good afternoon, uh, Honorable Chairperson and members um, and colleagues from the DTIC. Um, I, I, have, I've, I don't have a presentation on, in this regard. Actually, Umi, I, I've just sent you my presentation. If you could help me uh, flight it. If not, I will just talk to it. Um, my director general okay. was in the meeting earlier. Um, he did ask me to indicate that uh, the minister could not be in this meeting because she was having another engagement with the African Union, EU Ministers for Agriculture. And because she is chairing, uh, she could not join us. Um, uh, on the issues, uh, Chairperson, related to market access, uh, there are a number of countries that have been identified by the industry that we've been working on. Um, the first um, very important country is Saudi Arabia. Um, we have currently proposed a health certificate uh, to Saudi Arabia to request for market access. But in return, the Saudis have sent us back a questionnaire that we need to populate to provide our disease and food safety status. We were given about 60 days in which we should complete and we are about to finalize this one. Chairperson, on the United Arab Emirates, we have proposed a health certificate for both heat treated and fresh poultry uh, to the government of United Arab Emirates. They have, we have actually agreed on this one. It has been finalized and exports are taking place at this moment. The other important country that um, the DTIC has mentioned is EU. Um, I just want to indicate to members that recently the European Union changed their legislation on cage debates, which is something that we didn't foresee um, at the beginning. Um, we were of the impression that they were only looking for the residue control program because we had already been exporting our ratite meat to the European Union. So we submitted a residue control plan uh, to the commission, but the, our concern now is this new animal welfare um, uh, legislation that they have passed. We still haven't contacted um, the EU on this one because this legislation was only passed last week. The other countries, uh, Mozambique, um, Lesotho, Namibia, and Botswana, that um, industry had identified um, for Lesotho, Namibia, and Botswana, health certificates are in place and exports are actually taking place, except the challenge of the outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza, um, which has resulted in um, specific uh, restrictions being placed on the country related to provinces that are affected by the disease. Um, however, um, Mozambique um, uh, has been very quiet. They haven't given us any response in terms of trying to um, make sure that our market access is solidified. Uh, Hong Kong uh, is another country that has been identified. Health certificate is in place. Um, uh, but after the outbreak of highly path pathogenic avian influenza, um, we have, um, they have banned some of the affected municipalities, but fortunately they haven't banned the whole country. And uh, they have only indicated that they will um, have restrictions from affected municipalities. 
Um, unfortunately, Uganda as one of the countries that the industry had identified requires country freedom from highly pathogenic avian influenza. And then um, the current disease situation is um, uh, barring us from being in a position to export. The United Kingdom, um, as one of the countries that have been identified, Honorable Chairperson, um, the last time we communicated with them, they were in the process of amending their regulations because they had um, just uh, left the European Union. So they still had requirements similar to those of the EU. So meaning that uh, Honorable Chairperson, if we were to be granted market access to the EU, we would be in a position to go into the United Kingdom unless their legislation have changed up to so far. Um, um, the, the last country that was identified by um, a, a, a industry was Tanzania. Um, we have written to them to request market access. Although limited uh, exports have been happening to um, a, a, a Tanzania. Chairperson, um, there are other countries that have been identified uh, Malaysia, Singapore, um, which also to a large extent uh, do have um, a requirements similar to those of the EU in terms of um, residual monitoring programs and so on. So the thinking uh, was that if we can uh, be in a position to to meet the EU requirements, we will be in a position to meet the Singaporean um, uh, uh, health requirements. Thank you, Chairperson. That is um, the last country that um, industry had identified in terms of market access. Thank you, Mimi. Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Modisone. Okay, can I continue? I'm left with yes, only two slides to go. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Dr. Modisani. It's just to show the collaboration that we are having with Deldad, because this is an important element in terms of the master plan, Chair. The next slide. Um, next slide. Um, um, in terms of managing the import, especially the appropriate regulation of imports, um, some of the products that we have seen in the country, uh, Chair, were indicating, you know, uh, the multiple country of, you know, origin. And that now a uh, sort of um, a, a sort of regulation has now been sort of a uh, chair has now been withdrawn. Now uh, we've got a new regulation that will be starting from September 2021, which will indicate only one country of origin in all the imported products. For example, when you see the packaging in the shops, you will see that, for example, the package will say Poland, will say UK, and so on and so forth. But from September 2021, all the imported products will have only one country of origin. If the product is coming from, from, for example, from UK, it will say UK. So that is what we are talking about. This is actually the work that is done by the Department of Health. And then also the throwing of the frozen uh, product. This is another regulation that we are working on uh, together with the Department of Health. But I must indicate Chair, that we are trying to get the Department of Health on board here. Because when you talk about you know, the throwing of the product, you're talking about the, when the products are imported, they come in bulk, and then what uh, the processors they do, they basically, you know, defrost the product, and then that's where contamination normally takes place at a processing level. So we're dealing with that regulation now, together with the animal um, uh, food safety agents to make sure that um, we, we sort of uh, look at that regulation so that we don't actually bring to our people contaminated product. But we have requested the industry to provide us with evidence where they see, you know, that kind of a uh, practice at uh, chair. And then there's also, in terms of uh, incorrect uh, classification and under uh, declaration, especially of imported products, there is a SARS interagency working group chair that is uh, dealing with this. I've got Mahindra on call, uh, chair. We can also sort of also provide more details. Mahindra, chair, it will, Mahindra, I'm only giving you a second in, in this regard. Chair, he's dealing with the, the issues around.
around, you know, incorrect classification as well as under declaration of imported products. As you would know that our borders at this point in time, they're very porous. So we need to monitor whatever that comes into our country. Mahindra, just a sec, please. I'm giving you a hi, second. Chair. Thanks, yes. Lisa. Yeah, Chair, hi. The DTIC working with SARS and ITAC, the institutionalized interagency working group that looks at um, various issues relating to misdeclaration, misclassification, illicit and illegal goods. And uh, this agency and this group um, works in coordination with the desk. And we can also report at the next session of parliament on the progress up to date. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Mahindra. And then also that um, that takes us to the next, I mean, um, uh, regulation or measures that we are putting in terms of uh, managing imports. That is the act against around tripping. There are quite a number of investigations that are being done by SARS, again, the SARS entire agency in terms of um, around tripping. And then also the issues around uh, the, the, the quotas. And I'm, I'm, I must indicate that chair, we had problems here, you know, the selling of quotas, but that practice now has come to an end. And because ITEC has tightened the rules, especially between the black players as well as the, the large players there. So that practice is no longer there because ITEC has tightened the rules or guidelines in terms of the quotas, especially when you talk about the AGOA quotas. The next slide, Chair. I mean, sorry. Uh, I'm talking about Chair now. Apologies, Chair. And then uh, this is basically about uh, the trade measures that we've put in place. I've talked about the fact that already there are duties that have been imposed and gazetted in uh, or in March uh, 2020. And then also we have some you know, applications that are um, um, on the table now, which are being investigated by ITEC and uh, the investigations are ongoing. But at the same time, we are looking at you know, long-term uh, kind of you know, tariff uh, structure for the industry. We know for a fact that we have problems with, you know, uh, imports, especially dumping of products by, you know, countries like Brazil uh, and so on and so forth. So we want to make sure that we are able to protect our industry, but more importantly, to come up with proper, you know, a sort of a tariff structure that is going to protect uh, our industry. So that this work is being done by ITEC as well as ITED uh, of the Department of Trade and Industry. But at least there is a tariff that has been put in place as well as the anti-dumping application, which is um, currently being investigated by ITEC. Next, uh, next slide. In conclusion, Chair, I must indicate from production point of view, there's good progress. We've seen an increase in terms of production, as well as the issues around, you know, unlocking uh, uh, the potential to grow domestic uh, market as well as export markets. Uh, Dr. Modisani has talked about the different, I mean, the list of, um, you know, uh, countries uh, market access uh, that we are trying to do with Delrat to make sure that we're able to export because our export figures now are looking at only 2% now what the, that is being exported um, by our locals. And now if you look at 2020, 30, we're looking at increasing that up to 10% uh, of, uh, you know, uh, exports uh, to different countries. And then the issues around facilitating industry skills, a strategic plan is also at the table. And then more work that needs to be done in terms of transformation. Chair, I've talked about the 1 billion rents that is being put in place to make sure that we support our small players, but more importantly, the local procurement, as well as the issues of, you know, mainstreaming our black uh, players, especially around the value chain. And then um, um, in terms of the um, discussions around the, the, the funding, there's already I think work that is being done around uh, with, I mean, work that we have done with IDC, DTIC and Delrat, including, by the way, identifying some of the interventions that are being made by provincial departments in terms of supporting the, the local farmers, uh, especially, you know, looking at allocation of capital to the value chain for, for mainly, you know, the primary production, as well as the, the, the downstream, which is mainly your animal feed, hatchery, and so on. So we are also, I mean, um, working very closely with Belrat uh, in that regard, as well as IDC. Chair. So, Chair, I would stop there. That is basically, in a nutshell, the work that we are doing. Thank you so much. I'm not sure, DDG, whether it's anything that, that I've left um, in terms of, I mean, uh, the poultry industry master plan. Uh, thank you, Mamisa. I think we have covered uh, the all grounds. And I think it's important we also appraise the committee to the fact that uh, this kind of even influences do happen every now and then. And obviously, as we said, the, the objectives of the master plan, we didn't anticipate the outbreak. So we need to then, I guess the minister talks about along the line of implementation, we need to 
uh, um, uh, you know, rejig our instrument, make the adjustment, uh, you know, to suit what the industry is uh, experiencing at a point in time. And I think it's a, for us, it's a typical uh, uh, example of the tweaks that needs to be made as we are implementing to ensure that we remain as responsive as possible to what the industry is looking for uh, at the point in time. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we will take questions uh, from your side. Yeah, just the last one, Chair. I thought of let me give Mr. Miss uh, sorry, Eldam Chiza in terms of the agri industrial fund that has been launched by the minister, and then we close the, thereafter from my side. Okay. Sis Elder, from your side, the agri industrial fund. Thank you, uh, Nomi, and good afternoon, Chairperson and Honourable Members of Parliament. Um, Chair, yes, Minister did launch, Minister Didiza launched the Agri-Industrial Fund um, in March, which is a fund we are going to be using to blend the loan funding from the IDC. Um, the benefit for the Poultry Master Plan is that the... Uh, contract as well as independent poultry farmers would be in a position to access blended finance from the IDC. They have already repeat, uh, reported that they had assessed quite a number of uh, applications and we would be in a position to know at the quarter reports which they would submit how many farmers have successfully uh, accessed and participated in, in the scheme. Um, I just want to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, we covered, I'm covered from my side, Chair, and apologies for, you know, bringing in, uh, you know, my colleagues uh, in, the, in, the, in the presentation. I wanted to make sure that we cover as much as, 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 as I cover as much as I can, Chair, in terms of the work that we are doing around the poultry industry master plan. Thank you, Chair and members. Thank you very much um, for the input. Uh, the presentation, because uh, it's the first time that we're dealing with the uh, poultry industry as a committee. Uh, so it's not the last time that we'll uh, be inviting you and the Department of uh, Agriculture, uh, Land Reform and Rural Development uh, to update us uh, on, this, on the implementation of these uh, five pillars. Uh, I see there's a hand of uh, Honorable Dang. I don't know if it's an old hand, uh, but uh, can we take uh, questions, uh, Honorable Members? Can we please raise our hands? Can I start with you then, Honorable uh, Dango? Chairperson, it is an old hand, but give me the opportunity to then come in. <laughs> All right. Chairperson, Saudi Arabia is a large market. But if they're going to focus on that market, they, they, they will want to have free range. They would not want to have factory produced chickens because <clears throat> they have a definition that it must be natural. Uh, I've been there, I've worked there, I understand it. If people there need to understand issues and I can help them, I'll do so. The similar thing would go to Malaysia, the same thing would go to North Africa. Uh, the UAE is different, they, they have a, a much laxer import system. So if they want to, uh, I, I could help and assist them there because I was in the area, I know it. Two is chairperson, are we still being blackmailed by Obama's people with that visa? Hmm. Are you done there? I will follow the whip. Okay. Can we have the honorable uh, my mark? Uh, if there are also other hands, I'll ask the members to raise their hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you Chair. Let me again uh, uh, welcome the, the presentation uh, from the team and uh, uh, appreciate the manner in which uh, uh, the, the pillars of this poultry master plan has been articulated. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think pillar pillar number one deals with expanding and improving production. Uh, and pillar number two, one gets a sense that indeed there is tremendous progress uh, that uh, that we are making on this. Uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, there will be some area of concern 
uh, around uh, pillar number pillar number two, uh, uh, <clears throat> which deals with the with the with driving domestic demand and promoting affordability. Uh, I, I'm more in, I, I, I noted the figures that uh, that were given to us around uh, the increase of local production uh, capacity per month, and also uh, uh, and also the 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 five percent increase in local production year on year. Uh, the, the, the question that I want to, 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 to get clarity on is uh, this uh, a progress around the 5% percent, percent increase in local production uh, and also the, the local production uh, of uh, 245,000 and also 11,642 uh, ton or an or 8.4% per month. I just want to get a sense in terms of uh, the uh, extent to which small and medium medium producers are benefiting from this increase. If uh, if, 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 if you keep uh, the clarity around that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, the, uh, the impact of this, uh, a drive on the on the uh, poultry prices. Uh, is it is 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 it is, it, uh, is there a significant rise in terms of prices, uh, or there is an attempt to 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 to, to, to uh, manage it, particularly its impact on the on the uh, small and medium producers. Uh, <clears throat> The, the the other one on pillar three chair, uh, one get a sense that there are a number of concerns, uh, which obviously is linked to to barriers such as uh, failure on the part uh, uh, on ourselves to meet the biosecurity issues that that has been raised, uh, the health and safety criteria that has been raised. I want to know what is it that we are doing to meet these uh, barriers. Uh, the issues of uh, uh, tariffs uh, uh, and its impact particularly on medium term producers uh, because uh, uh, if, if there can't be a major uh, expansion uh, in terms of our exports, uh, the, the likelihood is that uh, the, the monopoly or, or, or the oli, or oligopoly in the in the industry will retreat inwards, and and definitely uh, it, it will result in in, in, in in the big guys monopolizing the the industry because uh, uh, one understand that. Uh, Indeed, this industry is highly monopolized. What is it that we are doing to break down this monopoly? Uh, the, 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 the large producers, uh, one get a sense that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, they dominate 75% of the industry. And the, and the emerging small local producers is only uh, uh, a few a fewer numbers. And, uh, uh, an area of concern is that uh, though though there is a a drive on the part of the small scale producers to to enter into the field, uh, this oligopoly of mega producers continues to be to be to be to be to be, to be a, an a, an obstacle to transformation. So I'm much more interested in terms of. Uh, uh, the uh, a concrete program that uh, that we are raising uh, to be able to ensure that this oligopoly uh, 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 feature uh, is addressed, uh, and uh, obviously there are a number of areas that are raised in terms of challenges. So one would be one would want to get a sense in terms of uh, 
what is the that we are doing uh, in terms of the cost of fit, which has been identified by the small producers as, as a challenge. What is that we are doing about the the, the, the scale of production? Uh, because in Africa, uh, definitely uh, we are we are we are we are we are dominant, but. Uh, the mere fact that we can't uh, expand beyond this, particularly in terms of uh, areas that they identified because of uh, medical, uh, me, I mean, uh, 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 certain requirements around around health, it 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 uh, it, uh, it, uh, it definitely uh, uh, affects the small and medium producers. Uh, uh, one of the one of the one of the small producer. Uh, the MD of SAPA also raises an issue around the tariffs. He said the increase in import tariffs will benefit only the large poultry business in South Africa, as less than 10 companies owns 90% of the market. Uh, I think this is an area that we need to that we need to manage. And how do we mitigate that? Obviously, the it will be important to get a sense in terms of uh, how do we ensure that uh, the imports are used to sort of break down this monopoly? Because it can then have an impact in terms of the price balance, it will have an impact in terms of the essential products, it will have an impact in, in terms of food security. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member. Are there any other hands, uh, Honorable Members? Um, if not, uh, let me also ask uh, some few questions. Um, on, on, on the Domestic uh, demand. Uh, there's a slide uh, with the uh, graph uh, that uh, indicate uh, that uh, there was a, a drop uh, around uh, October. Uh, can we get uh, clarity as to why there was that uh, drop? Um, but also, there have been uh, calls uh, uh, you know, from civil society in particular. Uh, that uh, uh, to boost uh, uh, domestic demand, uh, uh, chicken should be uh, zero rated. Uh, I just want to check uh, what is the uh, response uh, to that kind of uh, a request. Uh, also, with regard to the issue of uh, uh, export. Uh, I think uh, Honorable uh, Moimang has touched on a number of uh, issues that relate to that. Um, one, there's also, there's also been a demand that uh, there should be an increased uh, tariff uh, for bone and chicken imports, uh, particularly uh, from, uh, and also higher tariffs on frozen uh, chicken from uh, Brazil. Uh, I don't know if uh, what is uh, the response of uh, the department uh, with regard to that. Um, this issue of uh, the avian influenza, uh, I think there was an article that said we, we lost uh, quite a, 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 a deal uh, in 2017 when we were visited by uh, this avian influenza. Is there a way of uh, dealing with this once and for all, uh, 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 so that uh, you know we don't find ourselves in this situation uh, from time to time? Because I think this uh, this is one of the issues that uh, made us to be even overtaken uh, by countries such as uh, in, in Nigeria, uh, 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 for example. Um, but also countries such as uh, Zambia and uh, Ethiopia, when it comes to uh, the subsidizing and, uh, in, not, and also uh, coming up with uh, investment incentives uh, when it comes to things like uh, maize and soy, uh, why are we not doing the same as, uh, as, uh, as South Africa and uh, uh, call for uh, investment incentives? But also Zambia and uh, Ethiopia have even come up with the uh, measures to um, to ban uh, imports, uh, so that uh, they 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 make sure that uh, uh, their domestic market uh, competes uh, very well. 
And uh, the the other issue, I don't know if you have been managed to then co cost, how much are we losing uh, now that we are unable to, because the EU market is open uh, to, to us as a country. Uh, uh, but we need to, to sort out uh, uh, this issue of uh, the SPS. And I don't know what are the delays that didn't really get. I think uh, in the slide, it's just a one line, uh, but also um, uh, Dr. tried to explain, uh, uh, Dr. Mutisan tried to explain, but I couldn't really get what are the, really the delays in us meeting the requirement uh, requirements uh, of the EU so that we are able to enter the, the market. So with regard to that aspect, there are two questions. Uh, one, how much are we losing uh, by not uh, meeting these requirements uh, if we were to enter that market? But also secondly, what are the delays in meeting these uh, uh, requirements uh, uh, of, the, of the EU? Um, with regard to the participation, with regard to the uh, or the, the 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 supervision uh, of uh, the master plans is uh, both by the DTIC and the Department of uh, Agriculture, uh, Land Reform and Rural Development. In terms of uh, funding, uh, the contribution, how is the funding uh, being split? Uh, by the by the two departments yeah. thank you very much uh, um, over to you uh, uh, Ms. Mushab because I don't see any other heads thank you Jack yes thank you thank you honorable Lansma Chair am I still audible yes ma'am very much okay. so Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for, for, for all the questions, Chair. I will just take a few questions that are related to the DTIC and then um, Dr. Modisani, I'm hoping from your side you are ready with questions that are related to Delrat. Um, can I start first with uh, questions from uh, Honorable Moima? Um, I think the question around uh, the increasing the local production. I think he talks about the 5% increase in local production. I think that is basically, um, that is uh, what the, the industry has so far achieved. And then the question is basically, out of that 5%, how much maybe uh, our small scale producers have contributed? Che, I don't have the figures in terms of, you know, uh, out of that 5%, how much of our local you know, farmers have contributed, especially the small scale farmers. But what I can say is that the interventions that have been sort of put in place by the industry in terms of contract uh, farming, we are talking about 13 contract growers already that are sort of uh, supported through, uh, you know, the, uh, the through, uh, I mean, uh, by, by the industry, especially SAPA. So obviously the 13 farmers are contributing to that 5%. And some of the farmers, Chair, I must indicate that I've already visited some of those farmers. They are producing at a scale of some, uh, of at a scale of 40,000 chickens, I think up to 65,000 chickens. But what I don't have the actual figures in terms of that 5% increase in local production that we have seen. But more importantly, I think the 145,000 tons per month that is being produced by the industry. So I will uh, sort of provide you with those uh, figures, Chair. And then um, uh, there's a question around health certificate, uh, uh, Dr. Modisane, if you can respond to that. Uh, uh, and then um, I want to deal with the question around um, the question around um, the, 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 the monopolist in the industry. I must indicate that uh, if you look at pillar, uh, pillar number four, uh, we are dealing quite with the number of issues. I would say all the pillars, by the way, pillar number three, pillar number four, uh, transformative issues in terms of the industry, especially the participation of black players in the industry. Chair, um, 
some some of the work that we are doing is, for example, to look at the status of the the, the B status of the industry. And as I've indicated earlier on, that uh, the big players uh, already have actually uh, put forward the information in terms of where are the opportunities that they see to uh, mainly to mainstream the black uh, to mainstream the the black players. So we are not taking that I mean work very very light because we have seen a lot of you know vertical integration in the industry and if it's only few players that are in the industry they need to make sure that they open up for the transformation of the industry i've talked about the 1. Point, um, the, the 1.5 billion and out of the 1.5 billion already 80% has been spent by the sort of large players in terms of their businesses but now we need to focus on empowerment of the black players so working with big players chair there's quite a lot of work uh, that we are doing in terms of making sure that from a local procurement point of view they are able to benefit, especially working with uh, retailers there, but more importantly for the big companies to be able to provide the opportunities uh, across the value chain, which is the downstream as well as the upstream. Some of the opportunities that we are sort of um, discussing, it's the issues around, for example, uh, for example, we know for, a, for example that in terms of the feed industry, uh, there, are, there are no black players in that space. So some of the companies are beginning to say to us, they, they are the opportunities for, uh, for for us to mainstream the black players. Again, in the hatchery space of the industry, again, it's few companies, the, the five uh, vertical integrated companies that are there. So working with, again, the big players, they are indicating the opportunities that are there, including, by the way, the work that is being done by, you know, uh, IDC and so on and so forth. So that discussion is part of the master plan uh, processes, uh, Chair, and I don't want to take it light because we don't want to see our farmers only as growers that means uh, to only remain in the production side of the of, of the industry so in terms of the targets that we have set ourselves we are talking about 25 percent ownership of the value chain by the black player so we want to see by the to by 2030 that sort of a uh, sort of target it's met by the industry so we're putting a lot of pressure to the supper members to make sure that there's transformation in the industry uh, already as a startup uh, we're talking about the 200 million rents that elder has talked about in terms of the transformation of the industry. The 200 million rand is going to look at the transformation of the industry, not only in terms of production, but also in terms of, you know, the upstream uh, value chain, the feed, the hatchery, and, and so on and so forth. So that work is in progress, uh, Chair. We've taken note of that so that we're able to break the monopolist in the industry. For me, I think personally, Chair, that is very important in terms of achieving uh, sort of the transformation. And I must indicate transformation, it's not an easy thing, Chair. It is a journey, and we want to make sure that the industry commit itself. In the last meeting I had with the industry captain, I mean, with the industry captains, I've indicated that we need to make sure that there's an industry captain that is going to run uh, with the transformation agenda of the industry. But more importantly, to finalize the transformation plan of the industry, which we might share, which we will share with this committee in the next coming uh, few months, Chair. And also, I must indicate that our BE Commission is also also involved uh, in terms of this work, Chair. So uh, it's quite a, a comprehensive work that we are doing. The issue around the cost of feed, Chair, um, uh, what are we doing there? And I would also link it up with the question that, Chair, you talked about around Zambia and Ethiopia investment um, incentives around soya, as well as mainly uh, the, the soya, Chair. I must indicate feed, you are right, especially when you look at soya as well as maize, takes almost 70% of the cost of production. And we've seen quite a number of farmers, you know, closing down because of the feed. So in terms of the target, there's a target of 300,000 tons of feed that needs to be manufactured locally. So the 300,000 tons, we are looking at mainly the feed that will be manufactured locally, including, by the way, uh, like uh, the soya and maize being sort of uh, produced locally. Grain SA has indicated already that they've got a bumper crop. So what it means is that we've got enough maize and soya at this point in time. They've even given us chair the figures in terms of you know that um, the, the fact that they will be able to sort of a uh, 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 sort of uh, be able to manufacture that three hundred thousand tons. I mean, uh, supply that three hundred thousand tons of you know soya and maize to our feed manufacturers. So, in as much as I know that there are issues around investment that you've talked about, uh, Chair, but now we wanted with the industry to focus mainly on what is produced locally and make sure that our feed manufacturers that are 
able to produce feed at a much more you know lower cost but also to mention the fact that we have seen the price of feed uh, going up i think quite a um, high over the last uh, two or three months i think there was a question around that the issue around the affordability especially on the uh, prices of chicken as well as prices of feed the prices of chicken they remain quite reasonable, but the prices of feed, I must indicate they've been going up over the last uh, year or so since the implementation of the master plan. That's why we need to make sure that we locally produce our own feed so that we're able to keep our prices as low as possible because now we're importing quite a lot of stuff at this point in time. But with the bumper crop, I'm beginning to see good results Chair, in that regard that uh, we might lower the, 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 I mean, the, the, the price of feed. And then... Um, there was a question around um, uh, increasing the tariff and how does that translate, especially to the small scale farmers. I, I must indicate that um, in terms of the master plan process, that there are commitments that have been made by the large players, including, by the way, the transformation of the industry, the commitment in terms of the investment of the industry, the commitments around supporting the farmers through contract, um, um, uh, uh, contract uh, farming, uh, but more importantly, the skills development in the industry and the mainstreaming of the black players. Uh, indeed, Chair, the, the issue of the tariff, uh, it's one issue, it's a thorny issue at this point in time, and we've got applications that are in place that were submit, that are sub, uh, submitted by SAPA that are under investigation, but I think um, Mahindra can give more details in that regard, but um, indeed the monopolists, especially the few companies, uh, Chair, we are right, they are the ones that normally benefit in terms of the tariff increase, so the reciprocity commitments becomes very important in this exercise. Uh, that is why we have the master plan process so that the benefits are able to trickle down to the small players in terms of the transformation of the industry and supporting a large number of small medium uh, enterprises in the industry. Mahindra, if there's something that I have not covered there in terms of the tariffs, uh, please let me know. But um, uh, Chair, that is quite a thorny issue at this point in time. Uh, uh, the, the dumping of, I mean, uh, that, that is taking place in the the industry uh, and we want to make sure that we protect our industry as much as we can uh, i'm not sure whether there's anything that i've left from my side i try to cover as much as i can dr modisan thank you honorable chairperson and members um i would like to address the issues related to questions on biosecurity and what are we doing on the challenges that we are experiencing related to biosecurity? Um, to a large extent, um, as we negotiate and talk to uh, in industry members, particularly developing um, farmers, we train them on measures to employ to improve on, on biosecurity. Um, related to existing protocols in terms of how do they keep diseases out of their flocks. Um, in the current situation where we now have got outbreaks of diseases like highly pathogenic avian influenza, Chaperson, we do negotiate to export from compartments, which is um, well accepted by many of our trading partners. And then, um, or alternatively, we negotiate with importing countries or trading partners to export safe products to them. Um, in a situation like these outbreaks of um, con diseases of concern, we export what we always call um, heat-treated poultry, meaning that if there was any virus in in the meat we have, uh, we we do we do we do kill it through through heat. But the most important thing is to train farmers to employ certain protocols in terms of uh, avian influenza. The other question that I heard from honorable members was, um, what are we doing with a disease like uh, avian influenza and why are we not getting rid of it? 
it's 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 a normal flu honorable members as we know um flu viruses have a tendency of recombining um and even if we can deal with the h5 and 8 this year next year it will be a different virus so we are also employing a non-vaccination strategy um, uh, on our role members, uh, meaning that if we vaccinate, um, when we come to the attestation to certify that um, the country is free from disease, we always have uh, challenges of saying the reactions that we are getting from uh, the blood or the serum of the of the bed is the reaction that is caused by vaccine or by disease. So uh, for purposes of market access, we don't uh, vaccinate for conditions like avian influenza. Uh, in any case, uh, honorable members, if we vaccinate, we may also, especially if we are using live viruses, we may create a situation where uh, we are creating what we call an endemic uh, situation where uh, the disease will prevail irrespective of whether it's cold or it's a season for, for, for that. So, so that is why at this moment for our chicken um, uh, and, and, and ostriches, we don't vaccinate for even influenza to be able to access uh, important markets. Uh, it is something that can be debated. And then the other issue, uh, Chairperson, that I, I, the other question that I had um, from members is, um, what, is the, what is delaying our access to the European Union market? It is true that in terms of poultry, um, the market is open for South Africa. We've been exporting rat hides or, or, or ostriches to ostrich meat to the EU for quite some time now. Um, but as we agreed with the EU on, on the protocol to export uh, ostrich meat, they also requested us to come up with a residual monitoring program, or actually they call it the residue control program, such that we don't send uh, meat that has got certain drug residues um, uh, in them to the EU. But more than anything, when, when the EU introduced legislation to, to control or prohibit what they call growth stimulants, um, the ostrich industry agreed that there were do away with the growth stimulants in the feeding of, 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 of their ostriches. But the poultry industry still has not taken that decision, um, especially what we call antibiotic uh, growth stimulants, uh, which is why the EU is adamant that we need to give them um, a residue control plan so that if we pick up these antibiotics in the meat, we are not going to certify that meat to go to the EU. It is one of the issues that um, we've been negotiating with the poultry industry to come up with what we call a split system in such a way that um, poultry that is going to be exported to the EU, there are certain um, chemicals that should not be used in, in their uh, production. The last question that I got, um, particularly on, 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 on the, 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 the health certificate itself, um, in my presentation, uh, Honorable Chairperson and members, I indicated that we have um, submitted our proposed health certificate, which is normally um, an, a negotiated um, protocol with which we are going to be exporting our products. Um, majority of the time, Honorable Chairperson and members, if we submit, if we request market access, we, we start by proposing a health certificate to our trading partner. And then they look at it and then indicate what are the areas and then also indicate 
um, whether we will be able to meet their risk level. Um, and then the health certificate, it is something to which we attest um, that um, certain, the protocol as agreed to is being met completely. So, 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 so I'm not sure if I am answering this question properly because I, I lost connection at some stage, but um, I thought I should explain um, that slightly as to why do we have this emphasis on the health certificate. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members. Uh, Henry. Sorry, Chair, can, okay. yes. can I just quickly respond also to three, four questions, I think, from your side. My apologies, Chair, not responding to your question. I think there are three questions which I think are very important. The question yeah. around, I think there's a graph that was indicating, I think, a decline in terms of production figures from, I think, 150,000 tons per month to almost 145,000, especially, especially during the, the COVID time. Uh, Chair, uh, Chair, I think the, the, the answers, Chair, they, they, they are obvious that, you know, it was a difficult time for the country. The demand was low. Obviously, the production also because of, you know, the fact that there were quite a number of restrictions, although we know for a fact that uh, the food industry was open, but I think the COVID had a lot of impact in terms of uh, the production there. But it's only 5%, Chair, if you look at 150,000 down to 145,000 tons of chicken produce on uh, between October uh, 2020 uh, up until January 2020. I'm looking on a monthly basis. Chair. And then the, uh, the debate around zero, I would say vet free uh, uh, chair, it's a big debate at this point in time, uh, chair, which I think um, I think uh, the, the most of the lobby groups, they are you know, presenting their proposals in that regard. And really, you know, if you look at chicken as one of, you know, uh, I would say afford, I mean, I, I would say, um, I mean, a high protein kind of a product one should be able to argue it, but now we know for a fact that National Treasury is under a lot of, you know, um, tight spot at this point in time in terms of the revenue. So I would say that's a discussion for another day, but I think it's quite a very thorny issue at this point in time. The lobby groups, they are really making their submission, not only in terms of, by the way, uh, the, the chicken, uh, 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 also to look at some of the products that are in the food basket. So I think it's a discussion that I think from your side the chair will need a lot of, I think the, the lobby groups, they will need a lot of support in that regard to make sure that we've got a vet um, a free, you know, chicken and more importantly, to make sure that the chicken is affordable. I think uh, uh, pillar number two is looking at those issues in terms of, you know, driving the demand and making sure that we've got affordable chicken. But that's why some of the discussions that we are having with the retailers is to look at, for example, value packs, things like, you know, your is I think you know um, you know your chicken wings, things like your chicken feet, things that are going to be affordable for the poorest of the poor, so that during the sort of the the and buy you know chicken terms of really uh, the discussion around vet free uh, should uh, come into play in that regard. But we are discussing again those issues with the retailers. Uh, Jay. Um, yeah, Jay, I think Dr. Modisane has covered the issues of exports. Uh, Jay. I'm not sure whether there's any. Oh, we'd like. Like to uh, appreciate the the, the in from uh, from member Dango around UAE, the fact that he wants to uh, support the issues around free range, especially to make sure that we are able to export our to UAE. The uh, the issue around Obama people and the likes and so on. Uh, I think it's a debate for another day. Uh, but uh, we quite aware that um, the issue there around the imports from USA at this point in time, which we need to, to look at it. I'm not sure, Chair, whether can you hear me uh, from yes, your side? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, I think from my side, Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm not sure whether there's any that the funding, I've uh, left uh, Mahindra yeah, as well yeah. as um, uh, Mr. Stephen Hannibal. The role of the two departments when it comes to funding the plans, the master plan, the TIC and the Department of... Uh, Agriculture. Chair, can I just indicate from the DTIC side, we've got the agro-processing incentive scheme. Uh, 
which is mainly to support uh, the agro processing, you know, um, um, uh, value chain, and also uh, the fact that we have prioritized the, the, the poultry industry as one of the industries to be supported. Uh, but from Delrad's side, uh, I think um, uh, uh, Mr. Chisa has indicated, um, uh, Elder, the fact that there's one billion rents, which is mainly for agri-industrial fund, of which the 200 million rents, it's mainly allocated to the poultry industry, and already IDC is receiving applications uh, in that regard. And also, I must indicate, uh, both ministers are going to, which is Minister Patel as well as Minister Tokotitis, are going to have a meeting with, the, I mean, with IDC to look at, you know, some of the requirements in terms of the, 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 the that agri industrial fund, but more important to look at also the transformation issues. That's why I've indicated earlier on that this is the priority of the EOC. So, so the minister has set, you know, meetings uh, uh, in that regard with the industry as well as IDC and so on and so forth, just to make sure that the 1 billion rents, especially the 200 million rents for the industry is accessible, especially to the small scale farmers. Chair. So there's quite a lot of work that we are doing in that regard. So I would say in, in that kitty of 200 million rents, and you look at what a DTI is offering in terms of the industrial incentives, Chair. Obviously, it's plus 200 million rents that is allocated now industry and then plus 1.5 billion rands which is mainly for the large players so we are talking about close to uh, 2 billion rands which is mainly for the implementing of this uh, poultry mass plan and we're still expecting, by the way, also the large players to contribute to this master plan. That is some of the discussions that the facilitator is having to make sure that, you know, big companies, they are able to contribute also financially in terms of the blended funding. So, but, um, so, so those discussions are ongoing, Chair, in terms of the commitments from, from the big players. Elder, I'm not sure whether there's anything that I've left out. Yes, thank you, Nkumi, and thank you, Chairperson. I think she has covered well the industrial agro industrial fund chairperson, which we have made available to support black producers um, who are ready to, to access commercial funding or blended finance. But we do have uh, black producers who are already sitting on land reform farms. Some they have acquired land privately and they are startups or they are not yet at a commercial uh, scale or they are not yet solvent to be able to access blended finance. Such producers, we have about 2.1 billion that we distribute to provincial departments um, in conditional grants. So they are able to access 100% conditional grants to support them with infrastructure, with training, um, as well as with mentorship. Um, in this instance, we are also working very closely with SAPA, um, which then comes on board and assist with business plan development, with uh, specialized technical supports, as well as with EIA. So such funding can also be accessed by speaking to a local extension officer in all nine provinces. So those are the funding streams that we have from the department to support the poultry master plan checkers. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, Chair, there, that what, covers uh, also the issue around subsidies, Chair. Uh, you talked about Zambia as well as Ethiopia, that uh, they're able to provide some form of, you know, subsidies and investment into the industry. So uh, I think the way we have explained it, it also covers that, I mean, question, Chair. But um, indeed, Chair, there's, there's quite a lot of work that we are doing. And uh, some of the work, I would say that it's work in progress. Thank okay. I don't know if uh, this follow-up will go to you or to Dr. Mutisani. Why don't we have a, a global health protocol? I mean, if, if for example, EU doesn't uh, want uh, the, doesn't allow the, 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 the export uh, from South Africa uh, because of health uh, concerns, why then the, Domestically, we consume uh, those chickens that the uh, 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 EU has a pro problem allowing them in. Why can't we have global so that uh, if uh, uh, those chickens, uh, uh, they don't meet uh, certain standards, why are they now, those standards are lowered 
uh, for, for, for South Africans? Why can't we have a global standard uh, so that if the uh, EU doesn't uh, allow uh, those standards, also South Africans should not allow. Why are those standards uh, applicable for EU, but they're not applicable uh, domestically? I don't know if uh, the question is clear. Uh, it's my concern, actually. Maybe also, Chair, just one, the issue of the bond uh, uh, meet was raised also as one of the uh, challenges that we that we can manage. Can they just share uh, a view on that? Why is it so difficult for us to, to be able to produce the debunked ones? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Th those two questions. Um, if if you allow me, Chairperson, um, I can take um, the, 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 the 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 questions. Yeah. Um. The um, the issue on, on, on growth stimulants has, has been an international debate uh, started apparently by the EU chairperson. And there has been um, quite a big um, argument between especially the Americans and the Europeans at the World Trade Organization, uh, the TIC, will be better to explain that one. Related to this particular issue on the use of, of growth promotants in terms of production. A majority of the growth promotants that the EU do not want used on animals for production purposes are uh, said to be very safe products. Um, Zilmax, for instance, uh, if fed to cattle, for instance, uh, on a rubber chairperson, um, it will increase growth by uh, close to 15% of, of the growth. But um, if you take away this chemical from the feed of the animals for two to three days, then there will not even be a trace of, 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 of that um, a growth promoter on, on, on the meat. So this has been the argument that has been put up by the Americans in particular. And um, the European Union is adamant that they don't want um, a, 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 the use of those. So, Unfortunately, because we have to, we want to export to the EU, we have to meet their requirements because normally when they come up with um, such standards, they actually pass a law in parliament. So that is why we don't have uh, global standards on uh, some of these chemicals growth promoters that are being used. For chickens in particular, um, Chairperson and honorable members is um, the, the biggest concern is the use of uh, antimicrobials um, in, 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 in production, uh, particularly because we are feeding these animals at a very intensive rate uh, such that the intestines of the animals are not used to that amount of a high quality soya bean meal or maize meal going into their, into their tummies. They don't have tummies into their intestines. And then um, they, they, they end up causing an unnecessary um, increase in uh, bacteria in the, in, in the intestines. Therefore, it is very necessary for us to keep the bacterial growth down and make sure that these animals do not die because of the, the feeding rate. So recently, and um, the Department of Health is better in explaining this one, there has been concern, uh, Chairperson, about um, the rising number of 
um, a resistance to certain key, um, uh, can I call them antimicrobials, um, with a very limited uh, anti uh, 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 bacterial stats that that can treat certain diseases. So there has been a move towards moving away from using um, antimicrobials growth stimulants in, 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 in chicken. Uh, and from South Africa's side, we are very far behind in terms of coming up with that policy. I spoke to the Department of Health yesterday, and then they were asking me to get in touch with other countries to get um, uh, their experiences in terms of restricting this one. So we are all moving towards towards uh, restrictions, uh, honorable chairperson, but um, we are still slightly behind. But industry, um, if we try to negotiate on, on this type of issues, they still want to get the benefit of producing better. Um, and the argument is there will be very little food if we are going to move too fast into this policy space. I am being very honest on this one, Honorable Chair. Mm. <laughs> and then um, I think uh, when uh, Mayor Ngumi presented on the bone out um, uh, 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 meat, she was mainly emphasizing um, the, 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 the tariff um, issues. But majority of the time, if we are going to um, produce bone out uh, a, a, a meat, um, it is for purposes of increasing on the value. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes the bones are also associated with um, lower value, but at the same time, they can apparently um, contribute to, 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 I think acceptance, lesser acceptance um, uh, in terms of SPSs at the importing countries. That one, uh, maybe the, um, the DTIC could add a little bit on, on that one. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, members. Thank you very much. I don't know if we got any parting shot, uh, Ms. Mclaw. Chair, it's, it's just to say that um, we're quite aware of the toe-to-toe, -to -toe, you know, kind of, you know, um, issues between uh, South Africa as well as EU, but also as well as China. And uh, what what uh, Dr. Modisane has indicated now in terms of the antibiotics, um, you know, as one of the you know restrictions that are being uh, imposed now by EU, it's you know so EU time and again the, whenever we start to negotiate the market acts, you know, it, it's a toe to toe kind of arrangement. So uh, and we see that as a delaying tactics, a delaying tactic in terms of you know all the you know negotiations around you know market access as well as, you know, some of the, the issue that I think Dr. Motisani, uh, we were talking about is around China, the fact that they want to bring their stuff into our country. So we need to make sure that also from our, our policy point of view, especially if you look at the non-tariff barriers, we strengthen, you know, our industry, you know, very well to, to protect it, uh, che, uh, including what, I mean, um, uh, EU is currently doing, Che. So, so, so I, I would say those are uh, happening at a trade um, in negotiation space, Che, but also to 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 indicate that um, um, we, um, as a closing you know remark, we are quite aware that transformation is a main issue that we need to deal with now going forward, and also the fact that the ministers they are leading uh, that sort of uh, work. Uh, and I'm hoping that in the next few months, chair, we will be able to to give you more uh, in that regard. Uh, if there's anything that I've left out, chair, please uh, let me know. I'm not sure, DDG, from your side. Thanks, Mami and, and Dr. Medicine. I think we have covered all the questions. Um, I wonder if, Stephen Hannibal, do you have anything you would like to add? Or are you as good as me? Uh, good evening, Chairperson and uh, Honourable uh, Members. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Nothing to add from my side. 
Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I think that we we done. Uh, just don't want to, to delay the meeting any further. Because I was going to also ask, now that uh, UK is no longer part of the EU, what is the arrangement with regard to uh, uh, the, it, its market and also the restrictions uh, that were imposed by the uh, EU? But uh, that will be a question for another day. Um, uh, let me then take this opportunity to thank uh, the honorable members. It's been a long day. We started uh, with the plenary at 10 uh, in the morning, and then we continue with the committee meeting uh, that uh, started at 3. Uh, usually the meeting takes uh, three hours. It's supposed to have been done by uh, 1800 hours. Uh, uh, now it's uh, 1835. Um, we will uh, at this stage uh, release uh, the department, DTIC, and the Department of uh, Agriculture, um, Land Reform and Rural Development, whilst we deal with the internal matters uh, of the committee. Thank you very much, uh, Acting DDG, uh, and other officials that have uh, uh, honored the invitation uh, to come and present on the two uh, master plans. We will still continue with other master plans uh, in future. Uh, we're not sure yet when we'll be able to do so. Could be next year because we have a, a very short uh, third term program uh, that will start uh, from the 17th of August. Uh, today is our last committee meeting. Uh, we will be meeting as a committee again uh, on the 17th of August. Uh, even there, it will be an oversight visit, uh, but the actual meeting will, uh, like this, will take place on the 24th uh, of August. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Department. Uh, thank you. you are listening. Thank, 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 thank you, Chair, and honorable members for the guidance. Thank you thank so you much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Honourable members, I, I don't know, I'm looking at the time. We we still have uh, the DTIC uh, committee report uh, on the APP that they presented. So we have a committee report, um, but also we have minutes of the last meeting. I'll get guidance uh, from yourself whether we, we should deal with it with these two, uh, taking into account that if we don't deal with them now, it will mean we'll only be able to deal with them on the 24th of uh, August. Uh, can I get in a direction? I don't want to, I know we've, we have a, we had a long day, so I don't want to us to continue for the sake of continuing. Uh, but also, as we decide, we must take into account the fact that our next meeting will then be on the 24th of August. Can I get an indication, uh, honorable if, members? If I may, yes. Do it quite quickly. I have, my grandson's taken ill, so they have to go there. But if we can conclude quite quickly, I'll stay. Okay, that's why I want to get a direction from uh, uh, members so that we don't steamroll. Because uh, I, I saw the report has got about twenty-five pages. I'm not seeing the pages of the minutes, but I just want to indication from members if we should uh, uh, carry on. But there's nothing urgent about the, the DTIC report because uh, in, we, we're not going to debate it. Uh, we've done with the debates, uh, budget vote debates. Uh, it was not also part of the, uh, the budget vote debates. Uh, we uh, will be adopting it uh, so that uh, we hold the department accountable uh, for the for the report that they tabled. Honorable Mima. Chair, I, 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 I fully agree with you. Uh, we can't steamroll the, uh, the work of our committee. And therefore, I think uh, we must be seen to be instilling uh, a confidence in the work that we do. So therefore, I, I humbly uh, request that we defer the two to the next meeting so that we have an opportunity to process the issues, uh, taking into account the fact that we have uh, adopted the vote. Thank you. Okay. 
I take it, members, that we all agree that we defer uh, the uh, report and the minutes to the next meeting. Um, yeah, if we agree, just uh, as I was indicating that this is the last meeting, I was uh, checking with the, if you remember last week, we indicated that uh, uh, the management committee meeting joint would be briefed by the parliamentary staff or committee staff on the progress with regard to the uh, to our oversight, uh, which I've indicated will start on the week of the 17th of uh, uh, August. Uh, the briefing I got was that uh, um, the staff is still interacting with the departments uh, with regard to the projects. Uh, so, so there's nothing much now to report except to say that uh, it was agreed that uh, the 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 oversight visit will be in the West Coast and also the CBD of the, the of Cape Town uh, Metro. Um, yes, for, for on that week of the 17th. Uh, we will be, the, the staff will update us. They will, uh, uh, on our uh, WhatsApp group platform on the projects uh, that will, uh, will be visiting. So I thought that because we had promised last week uh, that uh, uh, this week, uh, unfortunately tomorrow, uh, there's no committee meeting of the public uh, of transport. Uh, is that the case, uh, Honorable Mimang? There's no meeting tomorrow. Oh, no, 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 there's no meeting, there's no meeting. Yeah. So I think what we'll but, probably, probably do, we'll have to organize a probably management meeting and then, uh, yeah. uh, indic and, and then communicate decisions to the members. Thank you. Yes, yes, I think you're right. Even during the 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 the, the constituency period, we can uh, arrange a joint management committee meeting, uh, and then circulate them the the the, the program uh, to members as well as the pro the projects uh, that will be visiting. If there is nothing else, uh, if members want to raise with regard to this matter, then I will uh, uh, close the meeting. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, honorable members, uh, uh, the staff, uh, also that we've been uh, working very well in the, uh, the second term that we conclude in the, this evening. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. Uh, we'll meet again, uh, as I indicated, as I've indicated uh, when we visit uh, the projects that uh, uh, will be identified. Thank you very much. Uh, meeting uh, is adjourned. And, uh, good night. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Good night. Recordings.